and I will hereby call today's meeting of the Bloomington Common Council to order. This is a regular session. Today is November the 3rd, 2021. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Councilmember Rallo. Here. Rosenbarger. Here. Ms. Gambalori. Here. Sims. Here. Piedmont Smith. Here. Smith. Here. And Sandberg. Here. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Clerk Bowden. Welcome, everyone. Um, we'll do the agenda summation. Um, there's approval of minutes, which we have none this evening. Then we'll have reports where a maximum of 20 minutes is set aside for each part of this section. Uh, the reports first, we'd start off with council members. Then we'll have reports from the mayor and city offices. Um, scheduled this evening is a housing report and a report on sidewalk equity improvements. Then we'll move down to reports from council committees. And finally, we'll have public comment. Um, or public yeah, comment under reports. Then we'll move to appointments to boards and commissions. After that, we have no legislation for second readings or resolutions this evening. We have multiple items under legislation for first readings, and they are ordinance 21-41, an ordinance authorizing the refunding of certain outstanding sewage work revenue bonds of the city, authorizing the issuance of the city of of Bloomington, Indiana sewage work refunding revenue bonds of 2021 to provide funds for such refunding and the payment of the cost thereof and addressing other matters connected therewith. Next legislation for first reading would be ordinance 21-42, an ordinance authorizing the refinancing of a certain equipment lease purchase agreement of the city authorizing the issuance of the City of Bloomington, Indiana General Revenue Annual Appropriation rep, rep, sorry, Refunding Bonds of 2021 to provide funds for such refinancing and the payment of the cost thereof, appropriating the proceeds derived from the sale of such refunding bonds and addressing other matters connected therewith. Other items under legislation for first reading is ordinance 21-43 to amend title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled vehicles and traffic regarding amending section 15.32.090 to adjust the time of a limited parking zone on second street. Sections 15.12.010 then 15.16.010, then 15.20.020, 15.32.080, 15 15.32.100, and 15.37.020 to reflect the changing of the name of Jordan Avenue to Eagleston Avenue. Sections 15.32.030 and 15.32.080 to add single, to add angle parking and no parking zones to Illinois court. Section 15.32.100 and schedule zero loading zones to add one loading zone to East 7th Street. And lastly, we have ordinance 21-44 to amend Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Vehicles and Traffic regarding amending Chapter 15.32 to add a new schedule for reserve motorcycle parking. Section 15.37.210 to clarify that the parking services director or designee may sell up to 80 employee parking permits. Total in zones four and five, Section 15.40 to provide that vehicles with accessible decals, placards, or plates may park in accessible parking spaces designated for electric vehicles, whether or not the vehicle is electric or is being charged, and section 15.48.070 to delete the administrative fee for towed vehicles. We will then move on to additional public comment. 
where in this section, a maximum of 25 minutes is set aside for this section. Then we'll deal with matters um, of the council schedule um, before we adjourn for the evening. Um, before moving further with regard to additional or public comment, members of the public may speak on matters of community concern not listed on the agenda at one of the two public comment opportunities. Citizens may speak at one of these periods, but not both. Speakers are allowed five, or I'm sorry, three minutes. This time allotment may be reduced by the presiding officer if numerous people wish to speak. Okay, thank you. Turning back to the agenda. Uh, again, we have no minutes for approval. Um, ready this evening, we will now move to reports. And we'll start with council members as I see them um, on my screen. So we'll start with council member Scambleri. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to extend an invitation to my November constituent meeting coming up this Saturday, November 6th from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m., still via Zoom for the time being. Uh, there is a link at sue4citycouncil.com. There is a join button uh, and you just need to click on join. So, and I want to thank in advance um, Director Adam Wason of Public Works for being our guest this month. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Scambleri. Council Member Sandberg. No report, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, good evening. Um, I uh, wanted to announce my uh, monthly constituent meeting, which is the, um, the week after Council Member Scambleri's. Um, so it'll be Saturday, November 13th um, from 11 a.m. till noon. And that's also via Zoom. And the link can be found on um, the city council website. So bloomington.in.gov slash council. And then you can click on my name and you'll see my calendar and the link there. So I invite people from district five, but um, also welcome guests from outside of my direct district. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Council Member Smith. I have no report tonight. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Council Member Rosenbarger. No report. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rollo. Thank you. No report. But just to say that I've been informed that the link provided for tonight's meeting on our website directs people to uh, a previous meeting on October 27th. So, Mr. Lucas, if you could correct that. Um, I think there's some confusion. Thank you. I'll take a look at that right now. Thanks for mentioning that. Okay. Anything else, Council Member Allen? Okay. okay. Hearing thank nothing, you. Thank no, you. I don't have okay. anything else. No, thank you very much. That was important information. Thank you very much. And I have no report this evening. Um, moving down the agenda, uh, we will have reports from the mayor and city offices. Um, the first report would be housing report, but before we get there, uh, Council Member Scambleri. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Um, since the housing report and the sidewalk equity improvements report are pretty substantive, uh, I would like to move that we set aside the time limits for reports from city offices. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second um, that we set aside the time limit for reports from uh, both officers for the housing report and report on sidewalk equity improvements. Um, will the clerk please? Well, first of all, do we have any discussion with council members? Thank you. Will the clerk please call the roll on that motion? Yes, uh, Council Member Rollo. Yes. Rosenbacher. Yes. Emily. Yes. Tim. Yes. Piedmont Smith. Yes. Smith. Yes. Stanford. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And that motion passes seven zero. Um, 
for the housing report. I do believe we have this evening, Mr. Zodi. Thank how you, Mr. You, President. Sir? How are you, sir? I'm good, how are you? I am great. Good. Um, um, if you're ready, please present, thank you. May I ask if all the counselors can hear me uh, well enough? Okay. Yes. I'm gonna do a screen share here. Um, and I'm gonna ask you quickly, are my slides, uh, let me make sure the slides advance here. So um, are my slides moving? Yes. yes. Okay, awesome, thank you. I was on a Zoom the other day and they didn't move and I didn't know that until I was well in the presentation, so thank you. Um, well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to give you a housing report tonight on behalf of the, the Hamilton, Hamilton administration and the uh, Department of Housing and Neighborhood Development. Uh, we're a staff of 17 and I wanna thank the staff there as always for their good work they do on behalf of, uh, of our fellow Bloomingtonians. <coughs> um, tonight, part of the reason that I want to give this presentation is uh, I am required by ordinance to give you an update on the city's housing development fund each year. But uh, after some of the questions and the discussion that ensued around the 2022 budget, I thought I should expand that a little bit and uh, talk about what else we're doing and what's going on in the in the uh, world of housing here in the city. And so that's what this presentation will encompass tonight. So um, uh, it'll include a lot of numbers and some, some inventory on the things we've done. Uh, for instance, since 2016, uh, the city of Bloomington uh, has um, tackled the issue of, of affordable housing through the creation and production of housing. And we've got a total of uh, over 4,000 units created. Uh, and when you look at the affordability in those, that doesn't include all affordable housing, but the subset there is that we've created uh, a little more than 1,130 affordable units totaling um, 1,672 bedrooms uh, here in the city that are in that affordable category. Um, we've got a strong focus on long-term affordability for both multi and single family units. So it's important to think about multi and single family unit for both rental and home ownership uh, affordable housing. Um, and this is all being done, I think I conveyed this at the budget hearing, but it's all being done with a great sense of urgency. We understand this problem is real. Uh, we understand there's a great amount of opportunity and a great amount of support around the issue of affordable housing. And so we need to make sure we capitalize that uh, on that and, and uh, harness that support and make sure that we are doing the job to uh, attract and retain uh, renters and homeowners here in the city. So there's sort of three guiding questions that I've shared with some of you, and just to share those a little more broadly with the community. Uh, when we're approaching this, it's a pretty broad issue, as all of you know, but we have to think about how we're assisting uh, those who are most at risk of housing insecurity, such as those who are, who are unhoused in the community. And as many of you know, the housing insecurity working group that put together the, the Heading Home Initiative uh, plan last year and early this, earlier this year um, is really taking uh, the reins of that, that project. And they're gonna be the sort of leaders on that in addition to all the community partners, which includes the city heavily invested in the effort. So a lot of that, um, a lot of those funds from ARPA are gonna be directed toward the housing insecurity working group. We won't spend a lot of time on that tonight because we're gonna talk more about rental and uh, home ownership, but wanna make sure that we are uh, keeping that fundamental question uh, on our radar here and, and that we're always keeping that in mind because that's a, that's a huge issue. It's a, it's a vulnerable population and it's something that needs to be a, a, a guiding principle for us as we do this work. Uh, number two, what are we doing to keep residents, renters and own, uh, homeowners in their homes if they wanna stay in them, they're not looking to move on and how are we increasing the production of rental and owner occupied homes in Bloomington for our future residents? So it's about what are we anticipating and I'll get to that a little bit later. So some challenges with rental housing uh, right now, 60% uh, of rental households in Monroe County are cost burdened, which means they spend um, more than 30% of their monthly income on housing. Um, we are the most uh, cost burdened uh, metro area in the state when it comes to rental housing. This is from Prosperity Indiana, many of you may know that organization statewide, a wealth of information on housing. So if you ever need that information, we're glad to hook you up with them and, and uh, they can share their information they presented to uh, the County Affordable Housing Advisory Commission last month. And uh, we've gathered some of that information uh, from that and, and are sharing it with you tonight. And the eviction rate in Monroe County is um, about three per 100 households, which is lower than some surrounding counties, but still pretty average in the region. Um, and 
the third challenge, and there are obviously more challenges, but three to sort of talk about here, uh, a third one being the impacts of Senate Rule Act 148. That was the uh, piece of legislation that the governor signed into law earlier this year that put more regulations around the landlord-tenant relationship and what the city or government could or couldn't do to regulate that relationship. So when we talk about tenants' rights and responsibilities and things that we're able to do to interact with our landlords and tenants, um, that was that was pulled back by the General Assembly a little bit. So it makes our job a little more difficult, especially when it comes to communication uh, with renters here in the city. So just a, a slide here from Prosperity Indiana to give you an idea of, of how Monroe County compares to the rest of the state when it comes to uh, rental uh, situations. Uh, the number of households behind on rent in the state versus Monroe County, um, children living in those households, total rent debt, um, rent debt per household, uh, the percentage of rental assistance that's been distributed. I have that information on the next slide. You see it NA on this slide, but I have it more uh, information broken out for you on the next slide. And then eviction filings. Um, and so this is a good uh, graphic uh, slide from Prosperity Indiana, just to give you a, a snapshot of where we compare with the rest of the state of Indiana. Um, solutions, so how are we tackling those challenges and looking at solutions uh, as a city? Um, we have, uh, Pretty heavy uh, effort on, on public outreach um, with rental assistance. We've sort of tackled that problem this summer by convening a lot of stakeholders in the community. A couple of members of, of the council have been on those calls, looking at the availability of computer labs around the city where people can go to apply for rental assistance. We sent out a mailer to more than 2,000 property owners and agents when we were communicating about the occupancy affidavit the council passed earlier this summer. We included in that mailing rental assistance uh, information so that the word could get out a little better to our property owners. And uh, later this month, the Monroe County Apartment Association and the Bloomington Board of Realtors is hosting an event with landlords where rental assistance will be a topic of discussion as well. We, we need to get the word out. The money is there uh, and the word needs to get out that, that it, is, it is there. And so we're doing everything we can to get the, the, uh, the communication out there and make sure that people are in the community are aware that that assistance does exist. So where are, where are we as of November 1st? The state gives, provides updates every week. And as of um, November 1st, uh, 537 households have been assisted. And this is the state's program. So those who are uh, unaware, watching at home or aren't familiar, uh, IERA is Indiana Emergency Rental Assistance. And so this is the program that is uh, using federal funds through the uh, Indiana Housing and Community Development Agency. Uh, at the state level. So that money is people apply to that program and each county has, um, has assistance that's provided locally. Uh, rental assistance has been provided thus far is $2.4 million. Utility assistance, 123,000. Total paid and obligated. This number is a projection as well as a real one. So this includes assistance that is uh, being paid, is, is going to be paid sort of it's pending and then it projects out what someone would owe and could, could be eligible for in that 12 month period. The rental assistance program does uh, rear facing and forward facing rent over 12 months. So you can get that much assistance. And so this number represents what that eligibility would be in Monroe County. So I'll uh, let you know kind of the background on that number and why it's a lot higher than rental assistance. That's where, that's where it comes from. So there are your rental assistance numbers for Monroe County uh, to date. Um, I want to talk about more solutions with, with housing and really talk about our, our rental assistance or our, excuse me, our, um, our Title 16 code enforcement program is an issue of equity. When we look at um, that we are one of three cities in the state to have such a program, um, there really is a disparity when you talk to other organizations around the state. We uh, were on a presentation with Prosperity Indiana and they showed a picture of a rental property from another city without a program and it was, it was stark. Uh, and so when we look at the provision of safe and affordable housing, 25,000 rental units across the city, um, it is an issue, I think, to advance the cause of equity that is a priority in this administration. I think we, um, I would like that to be uh, talked about in, in, in that way. I think that uh, why we do what we do is important. And you see inspection numbers here, how many we've done to date. Uh, ask after yourself, why? Uh, why do we do it? And we do it to provide safe and safe housing here in Bloomington, whatever the rent level. Um, and a result of those 
inspections is identifying more than 2,300 life safety violations. So this isn't about going after landlords or being punitive to tenants. It's keeping people safe. And sometimes that is everything from the smoke detector being out of place to uh, uh, no GFI in the kitchen uh, to make sure windows are operable. Um, and those are all things I know you know, and I'm not I'm sort of preaching to the choir of this group, but it's important for the community to know that this program does provide a great service uh, to maintain um, our quality of housing stock here in, the, here in the city, which I believe is an equity issue. Um, our fair housing practice, it's obviously worth mentioning that we work with City Legal and the Human Rights Commission and Barbara McKinney's good work. Uh, she hears uh, fair housing issues that come and those have been very minimal um, thus far this year. I think we had two that were resolved by the landlord quickly. And so uh, we are, are doing well with fair housing in the city of Bloomington. And then of course, with the Bloomington Housing Authority, uh, they're undertaking um, uh, tens of millions of dollars uh, renovation to all 312 of their units, which you are familiar with this project as, as city councilors, but it's important to note uh, that these uh, units, each unit is, is, has a, an investment range of up to $112,000 of renovations to make uh, the units um, quote unquote new. So whatever's needed in each particular unit to make it to upgrade it, whether it's a water heater or kitchen cabinets is our uh, new uh, house, housing authority director put it yesterday, a huge investment in the housing authority to bring those, those units um, up to speed. And HAND is in addition to helping through the housing development fund, we are, uh, we've provided CDBG funds to assist with sidewalks and ramps and solar panels with, uh, with part of that renovation. So the, the uh, city is heavily invested in of course, a strong partner with the Bloomington Housing Authority. So there are some solutions uh, that we wanted to present in response to the challenges that we're facing as a part of this, uh, this uh, housing issue. So the Housing Development Fund. Um, when we went through the budget, uh, you, you asked for a list of projects. Those are in here as well, but I want to just run down where we are. Housing Development Fund is uh, going on five years old. Um, it was created to provide uh, tools for both affordable rental and home ownership um, for, uh, to, to promote, excuse me, that long-term affordability for people at 80% or less of area median income. That's where you get into that. That's sort of what the affordable range is, 80% of area median income or less. Uh, revenue sources uh, continue to be developer contributions, um, funds from the Housing Trust Fund that's an endowment at the Community Foundation interest income, uh, loan repayments, and recover forward funds, which is a big piece of it, which I'll get into in just a minute. Here are the projects that, uh, that are from the Housing Development Fund. Uh, the ones this year, uh, with the uh, pandemic uh, had an impact on most things, but we, uh, are, uh, con we continue to uh, market our shared appreciation program, which helps a homeowner with up to $50,000 of down payment um, for a long-term affordability approach on the unit. We've done two of those so far this year. Um, and uh, we've uh, stayed in touch with uh, one of those homeowners in particular who sustained some storm damage uh, with the, the June storms. And so we have uh, continued to stay in touch and we think this is a, a great tool to help move the needle on, on uh, home ownership here in the city. And then for past years, you see 2020 back through 2017, some of the investments we've made uh, and uh, Will continue to make, for instance, at the at the housing authority. So, some projects there to lay out. Um, so, in summary, housing development fund total spent uh, is eight hundred eighty three thousand eight hundred seventy five dollars. Total affordable units created two hundred sixty six. Our fund balance. So, our housing initiatives and uh, you know when we make an expenditure, most of the time it's done in a loan because there are those covenants in there with long term affordability as uh, just over a million dollars. Included in that is the money for our, our shared appreciation uh, program balance. There was uh, roughly $400,000 allocated to that through Recover Forward. So that money is, is there and we continue to, to look for folks who can take advantage of that. We have uh, some outstanding commitments. Um, the RAD money, the $215,000 to the Bloomington Housing Authority uh, will be something we will be um, looking at encumbering uh, here before the end of the year, I believe. And then we are assisting Habitat for Humanity with uh, phase one of their Osage Place neighborhood infrastructure. So there's $200,000 that will go toward Habitat uh, yet this year to help with that, uh, the development of that infrastructure. We have an upcoming uh, contribution from the developer. Um, uh, almost $1.7 million will come into the fund uh, within the next year. That 
that contribution is due upon occupancy permit being issued for the development. So and we expect that to be within uh, 2022. So obviously we'll update you that uh, on that as needed or at the very least uh, when I do a report next year. So balance to allocate meaning money that is thus far uncommitted uh, is uh, $226,000, 426 uh, money that uh, we have yet to commit. We do, I will tell you, we do have some ideas for this and prospects, but not officially committed yet. So um, that is your housing development fund summary. And I'm sort of using this uh, in the hospital side is sort of a transition from rental into home ownership uh, discussion. Uh, I wanna make sure to mention the hospital site redevelopment project, which is a huge opportunity for the city in so many ways. Uh, this 24 acre site uh, will be property of the city of Bloomington no later than the end of 2023. Uh, that is what the agreement uh, stipulates. Um, the house or the uh, destruction or the uh, demolition of the hospital and surrounding sites will take a while and so we are uh, working hard as a big project team at the city to tackle each facet of that project, and housing is a big piece of that. Uh, the redevelopment of the core administration building, which the council designated uh, in January as uh, locally historic, um, could provide up to 40 units of affordable housing if our preferred project uh, comes to fruition there. Um, the, the preservation and redevelopment of the building is, is a big topic of discussion now, and we want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to, to bring that project uh, into reality. Um, and overall, uh, the master plan uh, and uh, associated discussion and studies have a, a, somewhere between 600 and 1,000 um, units of housing there. Um, so we sort of split them, the difference there and they're looking at about 800 units of housing that can be uh, uh, realized at the hospital site. Uh, taking into account uh, the economics uh, to prioritize housing, to prioritize sustainability, and that diversity of housing stock and commercial space. It's a, it's a huge project, as many of you know, but we do have a, a goal that we are zeroing in on for uh, housing there. Uh, and it's important to mention that as a big piece of where we'll go in the coming years on, on uh, housing production. So home ownership, uh, some challenges there, as we talked about with rental. Housing prices, I, I don't think it's a secret to anybody that housing is uh, tough to, to find if you're a buyer here, uh, but we've got good partners uh, with realtors and, and others who understand that and are uh, like to work with first time home buyers. So we, we uh, partner with the realtors uh, fairly frequently in this discussion. Our home prices are up 12% from one year ago with an average mortgage payment of around $875. Now that's just the mortgage payment. So as all of you who own homes know, there's a lot more to it than, than just a mortgage payment. And the median sales price of a home is around $250,000, which is really the top, top range for, for affordability if you still consider that affordable, okay? Um, and so the question goes back to those fundamental guiding questions is can our residents or future res residents find a house at the median sales price or below and are they available within the city of Bloomington? I ran a search uh, back last week um, through by uh, to estimate what's in the city, I put in uh, elementary schools, those that, that are largely within the city and ran a search and uh, the numbers come up with $250,000 homes and under there were 68, uh, 200,000 and under just 36, 150,000 and under there were just nine. So when you look at the range of affordability, the homes that are available for folks within the affordability range, which is roughly where these prices fall is, short. We, we are short on where we need to go. And so moving that needle on home ownership is very, very important. It can also be a lot tougher when you're looking at, um, at a, a multifamily rental housing development. We're going to break ground soon on the retreat at Switchyard Apartments down at, at Switchyard Park, which will be 48 units of affordable rental housing. Um, that's one development on one site. And you think about how many home ownership opportunities would you have to uh, create for 48 individual single family units of affordable housing? So it is very different when you're looking at the, the volume uh, and how you approach that, but it's still something that we think is a huge priority and that we're tackling here with, with a lot of urgency. So solutions to home ownership. Uh, we've got a lot of resources that help. Uh, we, got, we, got, uh, we have uh, home investment partnership uh, dollars, community development block grants, which are designed to both help build infrastructure, as I mentioned with um, Habitat for Humanity has gotten money uh, for its Osage development. We've also funded Habitat for Humanity homes with home dollars. 
um, our Recover Forward dollars and the Housing Development Fund uh, with local dollars that, that you all have been partners on with down payment and closing cost assistance, the Shared Appreciation Program, um, and looking at how we can get more people into the pipeline through our Home Buyers Club and uh, getting people in the process to become educated on what it takes to be a home buyer. And those are all efforts that are done uh, here in the, uh, in the hand department. Um, our Summit Hill Community Development Corporation, um, sort of the development nonprofit arm of the Bloomington Housing Authority is coming online um, with a, a total of $500,000 with ARPA funds, 250 this year, 250,000 next year. And then we've engaged a consultant to help bring that organization, uh, help it stand up. As you know, there's been transition and leadership at the uh, Bloomington Housing Authority. Our new director is, uh, is a real pro. And so she's uh, on board and we are uh, in conversations with her a lot. And certainly this is a big priority for the administration and for the Housing Authority to get that rolling. It has a lot of, of ability to impact uh, home ownership for the long term. And then of course, with the Unified Development Ordinance, the UDO, uh, we've had recent changes that allow for more diverse and dense housing stock in the city and that include uh, incentives for, for affordability. So to round it out here, uh, affordable housing numbers, um, total affordable units, I indicated 1,132, uh, uh, of affordable units since 2016. Um, the 2020 housing study goals, this is something some of you and I talked about and during the budget process, there are a lot of documents, and a lot of studies out there which guide um, this discussion, okay? Uh, the city last year, um, the hand department commissioned a study that was a more narrow focus from the regional opportunity initiatives study that was done, as you know, a few years ago, they did a regional study uh, and then they did a Monroe County specific profile. That profile was taken and was narrowed down to the Bloomington Housing Study uh, and outlined a set of goals for, uh, for housing units uh, production and, uh, and uh, what's known as replacement. So when someone moves out of one uh, owner-occupied house, maybe moves up uh, in the price range, of, you know, it creates more affordable housing that way. So the Bloomington Housing Study, which will be our main guide here, uh, since it is a city commission study, um, about 2,600 more units are called for in that study uh, by, by 2030. Um, that's um, not just affordable, uh, right? That's all ranges. Um, it's uh, 1,555 owner-occupied, 1,037 rental, with a subset there of what you indicate as being affordable. And that's, again, there are three different sort of ranges with um, 130,000 um, uh, and then up to around 200,000 and then um, uh, over 200 and 250, and then there's a rental uh, threshold of about $700,000, excuse me, $700 that uh, would indicate a rental payment. That's still a little uh, high when you are on those lower income brackets, but um, it does note uh, what the goals are in, in that study. Uh, these, of course, can be fluid uh, based on the market and population, um, uh, where we are at various price points and what the market's doing. Um, and again, they're not necessarily new production goals. They are identifying units. We have workforce housing that can be in there too, which brings in that uh, uh, higher income level from 80 to 120% of AMI, looking at workforce housing units as well, which is important for employers. So lots we can do uh, with that goal uh, and we will do and are doing. And so um, important to lay out though, what, uh, what one study, the one that will guide us most uh, is the, uh, the uh, 2020 Bloomington Housing Study. And so what's our strategy here? Sort of laid out all this information, presented it to you. Um, and so what, what informs us? What, how do we do this? Where, how do we go about it? Uh, we look at the 2018 uh, Comprehensive Plan, specifically Chapter 5. Uh, look at the Housing Study from 2020. Look at affordability data. Federal guidelines govern. You know, if you're awarding federal dollars, there are a lot of parameters there that you keep in line with. Uh, and then the Working Hard Falling Behind report that was done in 2019 uh, outlines a lot of affordability data that we can use as resources as too. Um, economic supply chain and property availability. We, I will tell you there are challenges. We all hear about supply chain issues. We are um, experiencing some shortages of contractors, finding contractors to do rehabs on homes that we, uh, that we work with homeowners on here in the department. We, we are short on contractors uh, and trying to find people to do that work is tough right now. So uh, all of those things will be factors in how we move forward on this. But we really, you know, engaging in proactive communication, uh, looking at some of you have indicated how do we approach this regionally? 
Uh, you know, these goals are for the city of Bloomington. But that doesn't mean that, you know, we, we aren't uh, uh, aware and engaged with our partners regionally. We work a lot with ROI. Um, we uh, are engaging more with the county. Um, uh, so we've got to look at that regional approach and what else we need to do. And so input's welcome there and, and how we do that. But it is important to keep engaging those partners, but also to stay focused here in the city, what we're doing to, to bring housing online. Um, and so the tools are the affordable housing team here at the city, which is a, a, a group of a number of departments that work on the, the uh, effort. Uh, we meet uh, biweekly at least, uh, the mayor's in those meetings, and uh, we tackle projects and it's really a, a to-do list. How are we executing? What are we doing to bring this uh, online and bring this to fruition? Uh, the council, uh, obviously all of you as partners and supporters of the affordable housing uh, movement and then boards and commissions, the redevelopment commission, the board of housing quality appeals, what's help, which helps uh, us with our code enforcement, historic preservation um, commission as well. Our financial programs, both at the federal, state and local level uh, and the new federal dollars, uh, rescue plan dollars, uh, which were appropriated through the 2021 and 2022 budget are, are really important uh, to put to use. The UD, UDO and sites for development, it's really important too that we identify those sites around the city, where are the prospects, what are the possibilities there, what is allowed there, uh, and where are we? Is it privately owned? Is it something the city can acquire? Is it something we work with a developer on? Looking at every possible option to look at how we can get more housing online here is important. And then uh, more specific projects individually, such as the community land trust that I mentioned and the hospital site redevelopment provide big opportunities to help with both uh, home, uh, home ownership and rental uh, here in the community. So that's it. I do want to end just by uh, talking about rental assistance. Uh, I will tell all those watching, I will ask all those watching to help get the word out about uh, rental assistance. If you know somebody that's behind, if you know a landlord or a tenant that uh, is in need, please uh, let them know that IndianaHousingNow.org will take them directly to the portal where they can apply for assistance. So it's really important. And I ask uh, those to help us get the word out on that. It's a community effort here. So with that, Mr. President, uh, that concludes my presentation. And I'm glad to take questions from council members. And I will stop sharing. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the, <clears throat> for the report, um, Director Zodi. Um, and we'll now go to council. Um, we have any questions, Council Member Rollo? Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Zodi. I, I wanted to follow up on your um, because home that program. Um, uh, what did what? we do for? for I, I'm, you sorry. Mentioned, I'm sorry, Council. You're breaking up a little bit. I apologize. I'm sorry. No, it's my fault. Can you hear me? Yes. So home ownership has benefits of building equity. So that's uh, clearly advantageous to, to people, uh, to residents in the community. And you mentioned that we assist in down payment assist, uh, with, with down payment assistance. Could you expound on that and describe it a bit? Uh, what, what's, what's the size of the fund? Uh, what's available to applicants? Um, you said four were currently on it. How many? How many applicants do we receive and so forth? So the, the uh, shared, shared appreciation uh, home ownership program is was something that was created out of the Recover Forward initiative. About $400,000 in city funds were appropriated for this. This is a, the program that will help um, folks who uh, largely are first time home buyers, but uh, will help them with up to $50,000 in, in uh, establishing immediate equity with long-term affordability. So that's a 99 year affordability uh, term on their, uh, on their property. Um, for those folks who don't uh, enter that program, we also have a, up to $10,000 down payment assistance program. So there is still quite a bit of money available for those folks to participate in that program. The program came online uh, last year, I believe through Recover Forward and getting it rolled out and set up and getting lenders on board did take some time. And so we're starting to see that, that come on with the, with the two folks that we've got um, enrolled in the program thus far who took advantage of it. And we expect to have a couple more yet this year if we can uh, make them happen. But in the midst of that, I think this year so far, we've done uh, two or three uh, down payment assistance programs where we help people with down payment and closing costs uh, up to $10,000. So that does help. Uh, and again, it's individual and 
that's uh, you know up to or around uh, six folks, but it's helping people establish long-term affordability and 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 get equity in their their home. So thanks for the question. What, what's what, just before we leave that? Uh, what's the status of the fund? In Which other words, fund? Well, the, the four hundred thousand dollars sure. that's committed to this. So that's in the housing development fund. So that those dollars will uh, uh, I will ask that they will need to be reappropriated so we can continue using them in the next year. So we still have money left, uh, but that is that is uh, in the housing development fund. That's where it is it is deposited. So to speak. yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rallo, Councilmember Boland, and then Councilmember Smith. Yes, thank you. I came late, so I didn't see the whole report, but I want to thank you, Facility, for the report. Um, mm -hmm. I had two questions, but the only one I can think of now without seeing the slideshow was about the number of units called for by 2030. Uh, should we presume that that's the number of net new units that we need by 2030? Uh, and how many units typically might uh, get replaced or taken offline in the next decade, you know, gross, in addition to how many uh, gross new units get built. Can you speak to that at all? I can do my best. Uh, that is a, a net number. Um, the study calls for a project 165 units of replacement by 2030. So only that that's, few. Yeah, yes, according to the study. So I think that's that's a fluid number, but um, yeah, I think wow. we have to take it into account with everything that we would, um, you know, identify. When, when you say the study calls for it, uh, mm -hmm. they're not saying that that's what they recommend be taken offline. They're saying that's what they predict will be taken offline. Uh, you know, let me um, see. Uh, that's sure why I'm saying. Like, I, yeah, no, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm trying to think of what adjective to use there. I think it's projected. Would be the best way to put it. Okay, they expect it to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay, that, sorry, that seems just... that seems a, a little low, uh, but uh, okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you, um, Councilmember Smith. Thank you. Thank you for the report, Mr. Zodi. Hand department. It's a great department. Love it. Um, can you tell me if uh, when you were telling us about some of the affordable housing data? Does that include students across the board? You mean with respect to uh, where the, as, as far as the rental versus home ownership and uh, the impact on the market of student rentals? I mean, it, it, it includes all rentals. So that would be, that would include students. Yes. Okay. So, so none of the data is able, really it's not collected so that we can tease out that um, because affordability has a, a different uh, impact to students as opposed to, um, I always say, regular working folks in the community. It, mm -hmm. it changes it because, because they're not usually funding their, their own housing. So there's no way to tease that out, right? Uh, not that I've seen, council member. I think it's... Um... You know, I think we see quite a, a, a wide uh, array of, of student rentals. You know, some folks who are um, you know, living in higher priced market rate units versus those who are um, always looking for a more affordable place to live if they're, um, you know, if they're paying for their own uh, school. And I think that, um, so no is the short answer to your question. I have not seen that teased out. And I think that speaks more to our, you know, our rental inspection program, we want to make sure that whatever the, the level, whatever the rent, that the quality is there. Sure, sure. Yeah. And uh, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. I just, I just wanted to kind of under, make sure I understood um, the scope of the data. So sure. thank you. No, it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you, um, Mr. Zodi. And this, this will be a revisit of Council Member Rallo's question. Mm -hmm. about the uh, home ownership and the down payment assistance. How does one apply for these programs? I, is this one that, again, you're widely um, trying to do outreach for? Can you give us some idea of what the qualifications might be and how people can get in touch with, I, I would assume it's in the hand department, right? It is, yeah, the contact us, send an email to 
to me or to hand at bloomington.im.gov and they work with um, uh, uh, Cody Toothman, who is our uh, one of our program managers here in the department, and he works with the, the homeowner. They um, they need to go through our home buyer education program um, and uh, meet certain income qualifications, either 80 or 60 percent uh, AMI, and uh, and they they go through there. and And uh, we work with lenders and trying to get those programs online for uh, either one mortgage or multiple mortgages. And uh, Cody works with the, the potential home buyer and all those instances. So uh, they apply right through our department. I'm glad to, if you know of anybody, send them our way and we can put some more information in the chat if that's helpful. Very good. Thank you for that. Yep. Thank you. Um, any more council member Piedmont Smith um, and then council member Scambler. Yes, thank you very much for this report, Mr. Zodi. And I, I assume that we will have the, um, the slides sent to us as well. Sure, there, I, I will. There, there was a version in your packet, council member, but I've updated a little bit of information in there so I can send those back out to council members. Sure. Great, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, have a question about um, accessibility uh, for uh, people with um, mobility issues. Uh, is, is any of the, um, the funding, especially for uh, people who are building housing or developing housing, is any of it tied to uh, requirements to have a certain number or percentage of units um, accessible? Um, no, not as a requirement that I can lay out for you. I will tell you that um, accessibility issues are, you know, it's a major issue when it comes to fair housing. We've dealt with a lot of questions uh, about that. Um, and uh, it's important to note that our that Barbara McKinney and our Human Rights Commission that is a big piece of what she focuses on um, with with respect to fair housing. Uh, I will also tell you that one of our programs that's funded through the CWG program is uh, what's called home modification for home modification for adjusted living, which can help uh, homeowners um, uh, adapt their homes for accessibility. So. As far as requirements on um, buildings, I think outside of ADA, uh, there aren't any requirements that I would speak to if that answers your question. I mean, there are obviously ADA requirements and things like that, um, but uh, we do have a specific program in hand too that will help people adjust, uh, modify their homes when needed. Okay, great. I might, I might follow up with you offline sure. on, on what the ADA requires and what we might uh, additionally require locally. Sure. Okay. Thank, glad, thank you very to, much. Glad to follow up. Yep. Thank you, Council Member Scambolari. Thank you for this report. Um, Mr. Zodi, can you screen share your slides again and in particular go to slide four? Sure. Uh, the type affordable housing rental challenges. Sure. We uh, get there. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Rental affordable housing rental challenges. Yep, that one. All right. I want to make sure I understand this statistic. Sixty percent of rental rental households in Monroe County are cost burdened, which means mm -hmm. they spend more than thirty percent of monthly income on housing. So, if let's say I'm a full time student and I have a part time job working at the union and I earn five thousand dollars a year, say just picking that number out of the air. And I pay, I live with three other friends and I pay $1,000 a bedroom for an apartment. Am I included in those cost burden numbers? If you spend more so than 30%, say, go ahead. I understand if it, it's more than 30%, but mm -hmm. if I'm a student who's working, who's studying full time and just happens to have a part-time job, it seems to me like I would pop up as cost burdened. Mm -hmm when I'm really not necessarily a permanent resident of Bloomington. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. But I, I do think to sort of council member Smith's question that, right. that those numbers aren't necessarily separated out. I understand your question and the, the rationale behind it. Uh, but I, I don't know that we would, that we have seen data that separates uh, students out there as much as it is just a statistical analysis of those who are cost burdened. And um, then, you know, so severely cost burden would be more than 50% of your, uh, uh, monthly expenses on on housing, so it's yeah, there is a range there, um, but 
the 30% would include anyone renting uh, in this market theoretically. Okay, regardless of whether or not they were they were something other than students. So it so in theory, the 60% of rental household statistic could include a lot of students. Is that yes? Yes, I believe it could. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, we, mm -hmm. and what I'm hearing you say is, but we don't know how many. Um, I do not know. Now I can I can dig into that. Uh, Prosperity Indiana would be good to ask about that, and I can follow up with them. I think that'd probably be a good idea, Council Member, to. Yeah. Better I, I answer your question. I, um, it may not matter in a lot of cities, but we're a college town, and a mm -hmm. lot of our renters are exactly that. They're students who don't necessarily need to do that. Could you go to slide five, please? Next one. Sure. This one? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, for a time during COVID, we had an eviction moratorium. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts or anything you want to share on how that fits into this picture and how it's impacted it? Yeah. Well, the moratorium um, ex expired um, in uh, August, then it was reinstated, then challenged and struck down by the court. Uh, that uh, moratorium was going to expire um, on October 3rd, but was struck down. So going back to the moratorium that was in place for you know, uh, going on two years, I think, um, we saw folks get behind on rent. Um, and if an eviction didn't mean an eviction couldn't be, there were emergency evictions, you know, reasons other than being behind on rent and things like that. But I think looking forward at the impact of the eviction moratorium not being put in place, there was a fair amount of uncertainty created following the expiration of the federal eviction moratorium. So let's say at the end of uh, or at the beginning of August, and then. The county, as you know, uh, county courts came up with an eviction diversion program uh, that was in place for a few weeks before it was um, advised against doing, if you will, by the state Supreme Court services. That was a mandatory eviction diversion program for landlords and renters. Um, and then now the state Supreme Court has, has put in place a, a non-mandatory uh, eviction diversion program, which uh, by my last uh, reading, um, I think we were still trying to see what impact that would have since it wasn't mandatory. The, the county program to help prevent evictions was um, uh, not in place uh, very long, and I think it had potential. Uh, I will say uh, that CJAM and HEP and all the eviction prevention services we have here in Monroe County um, are, are greatly helpful um, to help get people uh, through the system. It doesn't mean that they aren't ultimately evicted if there's some other mitigating factor there, but if they have, um, knowing that the resources are there, knowing that mediation is a possibility has had a, an impact here, I think, and we continue to support those efforts. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mm -hmm. President, may I have one more follow-up question for this round? Actually, um, I think there's another counselor who will start okay. the second round after my yeah. question, but Almost thank you for asking. You can clear the screen, Mr. Zodi. Thank you, yes, we'll do. Okay. Okay, thank you. And again, I do have a question. Thank you for the report as well. Um, part of your report talked about the um, Summit Hill Community Land Trust um, mm -hmm. and with a 250K investment for this year in 21 um, mm -hmm. and anticipate 250K um, investment in 2022. Um, can you, with regard to that investment and uh, can you expound on that a little bit um, as far as uh, community partners? Do we have other investors in this or, or how, or what can we expect? Um, and I know it's not come to fruition yet, but what can we look forward to? Sure. This well, land the, trust project? Yeah. Well, the, so the idea of a community land trust is to, um, you know, increase home ownership, uh, affordability, um, or the land trust, you know, owns the property and there's, there's leases or, or some a, a similar model for those occupying the homes that the Summit Hill uh, nonprofit, Summit Hill Community Development Corporation exists now as the nonprofit development arm of the Bloomington Housing Authority. And so uh, we have identified that as, as the best tool, I think, to stand up a land trust. Uh, the $250,000 uh, and then uh, this year and then the two fifty dollars next year will help uh, stand that up organizationally. The, I, I know there was some discussion 
um, about, you know, should there be a more of a multi-million dollar investment in a land trust right now? And, and we don't believe that it's currently ready for that, so to speak. That's with the transition leadership of the BHA and uh, we're engaging a consultant who is a uh, uh, well-known professional in the land trust movement to uh, provide advice on how to stand that organization up in a sustainable way. Um, and then once that is uh, um, operationalized, as, as you will, as a, as, a, as a land trust, and we look at where is it possible that the city or another entity would transfer property to the land trust to then engage in housing development that way. And that is that's not, uh, wouldn't expect that to happen this year on any transfers or any housing development starting. We are still very much working on getting the organization um, uh, organized, uh, not to offer a duplicative word, but we're still working on standing it up. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's where it is. That's the status of it. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, before we go to the second round, um, Council Member Rosenbarger, did you have any first round questions? Not to put you on the spot, just trying to be respectful. No, thanks. No, not right okay. now. No, I might okay. jump in the second round. Okay. Not, not oh, not. Thank, thank you very much. Moving the second round. Council Member Boland, then Council Member Scambleri. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, could you put the slides back up? Sure. And uh, while uh, I was going to ask you to, to, to uh, go through them, a couple of them, but uh, can you send us the slideshow after this is done? we Will do. Yep. Okay. Uh, slow down. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, sorry, keep, I was, keep going, keep going. I was sort of going back more. to the beginning, Councilor. I apologize. No, 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 no. I, I came in about halfway through. Okay. Uh, wait. Yeah, keep go forward. Yeah. Okay. There was a number about of uh, total number of units. I think. Keep going. Totally good number of units. Uh, in what? It was about ten thousand units. There's a slide that had that talked about the different number of. Uh, it, it's. No, it's next one more. One more. It was further on. Keep going. Here we go. This is the one. Um, so inspection the inspection uh, numbers. Yeah. Yeah, it was inspection. Numbers. So, uh, is this? Does this? Does the first three bullet points represent the total number of rental units in town, or are there any that don't go inspected? Uh, you know, like how how are we keeping up with those numbers? Uh, we are keeping up well. Uh, the rental the rental inspection flow is uh, sort of a moving target. We don't inspect every property every year, right. and you know we inspect them as indicated on three, four, or five year permits. And those permits aren't all issued in the same year, so you have at any given time a rolling number of permit of cycle permits that are up that require inspection. Then you also have complaint inspections. So when a tenant uh, you know, feel something's wrong with their unit and uh, they feel the city needs to come and check it out. We do a number of those. Um, we have required inspections through the home program, for instance, that required by federal funding. So those represent the number of to the total number of inspections year to date as of October 31st. So all those inspections, all the permit years are indicated that way. So it's hard to break them out um, any further council member where it gives you an indication of we're keeping up. We are not behind on scheduling. Uh, when, when permits come up, we are staying on top of scheduling. Our inspectors are out. Uh, you know, they're not in the office that much because uh, they're always out doing something. If they're not inspecting a unit, they are of course. looking at their, uh, it, you know, they're, they're working through their neighborhood on the, from the Title VI uh, weeds and trash, if you will, uh, perspective. So we're doing well with, uh, with, with uh, keeping up on those, making sure that permits, when they are up, when the cycle is up that we're inspecting them. When you're in large multifamily buildings, do you uh, do your inspectors check every single unit or do they do samples of large buildings? Oh, they'll check each unit if that's what the cycle permit, if the, that's what's required. So now okay. the inspections take very various times, right? Like if you, depending on what um, the history shows for the property, if it's in a property where there's been a history of issues or violations, or if it's new, you know, move in and spare a, a, a occupancy permit inspection. I mean, they, they can take minutes, they can take several minutes. It depends on the, on the uh, property. Okay. But just to be clear, we shouldn't assume that the total number of rental units in town uh, are necessarily reflected in the numbers of the total of the three, four and five year permits. 
not as a year to date. There are 25,200 rental units in the city. So right. over a span of five years, I think you could better assume from that, from that data point that in five years, you're going to have all those inspected because there's no greater length of a permit than five years. You see so you're I mean? saying that this is, this is the number of units inspected in one year? This is, yes, as of, uh, as of October 31st, this is the number of inspections that have been done since January 1st up to oh, October okay. 31st. So that's just this year. Reflect, yeah, okay, now, now the numbers make sense to me. Thank you okay. so much. Yep. Thank you. Can, can, can you clear the screen? Actually, don't. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, Council no, Member Scambellari, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Zodi, can you go back to slide five, the one with the map of Indiana on it? Yes. Okay. So to make sure I'm understanding correctly, all right, in Monroe County, there have been 2,757 households behind on rent. Is that correct? As of uh, October, I believe it says October 9th. Uh, okay. Yes. And across those 2,700 households, there are 1,600 children. As indicated by the data, yes, that's correct. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yes. All right, so the Monroe County Rental Assistance as of 11 one so 491 households were assisted. That's 491 of the 2,700 plus, right? Yes, and just for uh, accuracy, council member, the, the, day, the member as of the first of November is 537. So I that the packet, the, the, the presentation that went out in the packet has been updated for because that number, the data wasn't available, but it's 537 households. Yes, out of that 2700. So so there are 2200 households um, that have this opportunity that haven't necessarily taken advantage of it. Roughly, yes, unless something else has been worked out with their landlord. And yes, I think you should as we we should assume that the problem is still there. That people still need help, if I may. All right. And for the Monroe County Rental Assistance Fund, do we have any data on gender and ethnicity or female head of household or veteran status or households mm -hmm. with children or anything like that? I don't, I don't with me. Um, I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear your question. Necessarily, but if you could share it, I'd be interested in seeing that. I, I would have to get that from my HCDA. I can ask them. They have that. This this data comes from the state. So there's a progress report uh, that's posted every week uh, that has every county in the state and what information has been distributed uh, to that county. So I can ask them what, what demographic information there might be that they could share. So I don't have it with me tonight, though. Okay. I would appreciate it. Um, I have one more big picture question, but I can wait. I've already taken up my two for this round. I can't see the screen of everyone here. So I um, can you put a screen, Mrs. Logan? Sure. Thank you. I'm sorry, I need to see oh, it's everyone. a choreography when it comes to Zoom. Oh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> I just need to see everyone. Um, Council Member Rollo. Uh, well, actually, before we do that, or, yeah, Council Member Rollo, please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Zodi, regarding um, strategies for increasing housing stock in the community, uh, is part of the palette that you're looking at um, city assistance in the form of extending infrastructure, for instance, uh, to development sites or within them? And do you have any sort of collaboration with planning and transportation? If that's the case, do you have collaboration with that department in terms of maybe that as a as a potential strategy? I know that's an expensive strategy, but sure, you know maybe um, maybe it could be employed, especially when regarding you know getting a commitment for a certain housing type. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll tell you a couple of things on that, Council Member. Um, we do work with planning and transportation daily. I mean, they're part of the affordable housing team that we meet with. We, I talk to Scott Robinson daily. Um, and so we collaborate, work with them uh, constantly. Uh, we are, there are two things, two specific projects I'll mention. And then the prospect, are we actively looking at extending infrastructure for possible development? Um, my answer 
is um, not that I know of right now. However, uh, the I will mention go back to the Osage Place infrastructure uh, contributions the city is making. That's a very heavy investment in the Osage Place neighborhood, which is infrastructure uh, uh, money. Uh, and then the um, development on 17th Street uh, that is currently being developed by Trinitas, there's infrastructure being uh, put in by them, and then they will then transfer that property to the city. So while infrastructure will be in place, it will be up to us to figure out what to do with it next. So I think in summary, there are partnerships on infrastructure. I can't tell you right now that there's a development that we're looking at extending infrastructure to. I think that's, I just don't have, I, I don't think there's a project there unless planning uh, thinks of something I haven't, but I think it's any and all ideas are welcome for how we might push this ball forward. It seems like that might be promising, but I don't know enough. And, uh, okay. you know, maybe I'll speak to you privately about that. And, and with uh, Director Robinson. Yeah, glad to, glad to talk more. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions from council? Okay, before I return to council members Candelaria, I do have one. Uh, Mr. Zodi, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, the core building. Yes. Um, and you, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I misheard anything, um, but I thought you said there was some ongoing discussion about the designation. Um, did, did I hear that correctly? Well, the, I, I just mentioned and, that the council. And, and, and what ahead. I'm getting at, I mean, if there's some information that shouldn't, you know, that you're still working through, I'm fine with that. But I was wondering if that's what I heard, but I do remember when we designated it, part of our conversation was that uh, if we could not reach the affordable, affordable housing uh, plans or goals, then that could um, have some effect on the designation. Is, is that part of the discussion or can you expound on that just a bit or let us know where we are in that uh, on those I think, lines? I think your description is still accurate. I will tell you that as the, okay. as the timeline has moved along there, we're looking at affordability of, um, you know, what it takes to uh, stabilize the building, preserve it um, while the rest of the site is is demolished, um, and then uh, what future liabilities might hold for the the cost of, of maintaining the building. It is our you know, our our goal uh, to save it. That's what um, council designated as locally historic. But we are mindful and have to be constantly mindful of the dollar values associated with that and what works, as you indicated. Mr. President, with the overall project uh, uh, viability, we there's a great uh, project that could go in there, but we have to be mindful and practical and realistic about what that means in the long-term affordability and the feasibility uh, from the city's perspective once we own the, the property and the core building. And that's something that we are in constant discussions with IU Health about as those pieces of that project all uh, operate and move in different ways and different times. Um, uh, it's a it's a top on our plate uh, to to get the hospital project moving or uh, to keep it moving. I should say it's already moving uh, quickly. But as we look at where the site is this time next year and where the core building is, that's something we have to keep a, a close eye on, and we are. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, um, Council Member Scambolari. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a clumsy question, but I'd appreciate your helping me think through this, Mr. Zodi. Sure. Um, Sometimes it seems to me that programs and assistance can focus on renters and aspiring homeowners and, and both can benefit from that. Um, but some programs are actually mutually exclusive and, and either promote affordable renting or affordable home ownership. Um, do you see that trending any particular way? How do we decide, how is it decided what we emphasize, whether it's ownership or renting in a given year? Does mm -hmm. that make sense? I think so. Uh, I'll try not to be clumsy in my answer. <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 you know, I, you look at, you know, kind of what I described earlier, you've got, you know, soon we'll break ground on 48 units of affordable housing, which is a great development down at Switchyard Park. And so in another year, we'll have, uh, it's a total of 64 units, but 48 will be affordable. So we have a, a, a nice new development right adjacent to Switchyard Park for rental housing. They're working with Stonebelt to have 10 of those units available for Stonebelt clients, which is a great partnership. And then you look at then what does it take to 
bring online 48 homeowner owner occupied units. And so I think the the focus is different in that um, we've got a uh, it's it's a slower move, right? You're you're trying to get you know we had two people uh, sign up and enroll in our shared shared appreciation program, which helps two people with a great program to own homes with long term affordability. So we have to get it's a it's a parallel track all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Everything we're doing for rental housing and everything we do we do for home ownership. And home ownership is a little more elusive because it's harder to, to move that needle. But I don't think the um, that we're ever sort of, and you're not telling us we're confused. I don't ever think I never feel like we're not uh, focusing on both. I should yeah. say. Well, does, that, I, does that make sense? It does. And I was struck by um, Councilmember Rolla's earliest comments this evening that home ownership is generally means equity. And, and right. that's a powerful tool out of poverty and that can benefit. And so mm-hmm. I, I, I appreciate seeing an emphasis there when we can, but I understand it's also, it's a long game, so. It is, and I'll tell you that uh, if I may, um, being creative there is really nothing, shouldn't be creative everywhere when it comes to this challenge, but home ownership, uh, creation affordability is really important. We, we're always talking about you know, how do we, Get, can we do this with this home? Is there a, is there a, are there units that we could acquire or work with a developer on to make them affordable? Or it's it's brainstorming all the time. It's trying to get that needle moved. And because I have been through it myself, I was a young professional. I had trouble finding my first house in Bloomington, and you know that was 15 years ago. And you're still you you you, you draw from your own experience, and you know the experiences there from the people that you hear about, and the people that you read about, and the people that the realtors tell you about, and we all hear about. And you've just got to continue to be creative and just pushing that ball forward as much as you can. And I think um, uh, this environment allows for that, uh, but we have to stay focused on what the results are. And that's something we're trying to do uh, very hard. Okay. I had a lot of questions tonight, so thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good good discussion. Thank you, Mr. President. Sorry. I just talk, 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 and I'm muted, Um, but I'm okay now. Do we have any other questions from any fellow council members? Okay, seeing none, thank you again for your presentation, Mr. Zodi. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure many of us will be in touch with you for, to continue discussions. Thank you. I'll do the same with follow-ups. I've got a number of notes, so I'll, I'll uh, work on those follow-ups, Mr. President. So thanks for the, your attention tonight. You're quite welcome. And make sure all we right. get copies of those slides as you indicated. So thank you. Will do. Thank you all. All right, moving on through um, reports from mayor and city offices, uh, report on sidewalk equity improvements. Um, I see we have Ms. Mallory Rick file with us this evening. Um, and if you're ready, uh, please proceed. Great, hi, thank you for having me. Um, so as you know, my name is Mallory Rickfile. I'm the Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator for the City of Bloomington Planning and Transportation Department. And um, as the planning, uh, as the Bike and Pedestrian Coordinator for the City of Bloomington, it makes sense that I love walking and I love looking at sidewalks and tree plots and, um, and, and I'm always thinking about them. Um, But I wanna share with you an experience that I had in June. Um, I went to an event that was hosted by the Council for Community Accessibility called Increasing Transportation in Mobility Options for All. Um, Some of you were there, uh, so forgive me if you know this already. Um, But during this event, uh, the, the CCA paired city staff, elected officials, residents uh, were paired with uh, into small groups and they had folks uh, across a wide spectrum of uh, requiring mobility considerations in our network. And in my group of four, there was a woman uh, who's blind and there's a man who used an electric wheelchair. And I'm not gonna get into (laughs) the details of this, but um, due to a slight miscalculation on my part, um, the group ended up going a little off course. And so this is all to say that 
the event wasn't intended um, to be a 1.5 mile walk on the city sidewalks in the areas surrounding Switchyard Park. Um, and that was kind of a, a harrowing experience. The experience was to encounter our sidewalk network from different perspectives and being able to discuss that. And so after I left that event, um, I, I realized that I have now seen sidewalks in a different perspective, the very sidewalks that I've been uh, walking on for 15 years in a new light. And in public health, we call this environmental reevaluation. Um, so I thought I knew everything about sidewalks and the conditions of our sidewalks only to find out that I had a lot more to learn. Um, so this is all to say thank you for having me. Um, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful that the reason why I'm here today is to talk about walking, uh, which is one of my favorite activities and, uh, and the sidewalk network in Bloomington, which has enabled that sidewalk and trail network that has enabled that behavior in my life. Um, I hope the work that I'm doing and the work that I continue to do um, in, uh, allows you all to see sidewalks in a new way. Um, so I have a theory, and the theory is, is that if you want to know the extent to which a community values inclusivity and accessibility in their transportation network, uh, you should simply look at the ground. Um, sidewalks or the network of sidewalks, um, they have the potential to connect a seemingly infinite number of people uh, to wherever they go or want to go. Um, at any time um, for a time period that could last generations. And, um, and so when a community invests in sidewalks, this transportation network, they're not just investing in concrete and right of way and design, they're investing in the agency of their residents to carry out the business of their lives, um, to explore the world with their senses, to connect with one another. Um, this is especially true for residents who have experienced systematic underinvestment or those needs who are not met through a traditional transportation approach. So uh, the city of Bloomington maintains 234 linear miles of street. 44% of those miles or 102 miles prioritize moving um, and having places to store cars over the safety of people who are using the street. And I've created a slide map here that you will see on the screen. I have information from the USDA, which indicates what are essentially food deserts, low income, low access areas, um, and areas that there are at least 100 people who do not have access to a car. And I have uh, transposed that over the missing sidewalk map that was created by Mark Stossberg. Um, now seems as good a time as any to say that Mark Stossberg um, is my project collaborator on this. He, um, he answered a ton of questions and helped me uh, with my mapping skills. If you saw them last year, uh, they are not to the, the level that they are now. And that is because of Mark's patience and technical support. So I wanna give him a shout out. So you can see that um, there are areas where we have long stretches of sidewalk that are missing on roads that exist within um, these census block groups. I also want to introduce the concept of a desire path. Sometimes they're called goat paths, um, but the desire path is the more correct term. Um, it is a trail that is caused by repetitive foot traffic, and you see them oftentimes along the side of the roadway. And it demonstrates areas where there's demand for a sidewalk, but there isn't a sidewalk facility. And so on this picture, you can see it on the left-hand side of the road. This is South Overhill Drive. The road that you are looking at is East Third Street. So this is a tour of some of the desire paths in Bloomington. 
This desire path, this is one of my favorites, uh, is uh, located on West Smith Avenue between South College and South Walnut Street. You can see in um, the background of the photo, there are pavers that are thoughtfully placed, um, providing a connection between the Beeline Trail and some of the uh, residential areas between First and Second Street. And then um, this is really more of a, a desire intersection because it ex extends across the street into the foreground of the picture. This picture is West Bloomfield Road at the intersection of Rolling Ridge Way. In this photo, there are five lanes of traffic for motorized vehicles. There's a right turn lane, there's a left turn lane and a through lane, and then two lanes of traffic on the other side. Um, and there's only one pedestrian path. Um, West Bloomfield Ro Road carries over 20,000 vehicles per day making it one of the most frequently traveled thoroughfares in the city. If you look closely, you can see that there's a bus shelter in the background of this photo. That bus stop shelter is disconnected on both the east and west side. And there is a small desire path that is shown on the image. It's trickier to navigate than it looks. I fell <laughs> as I was trying to get back. Uh, from taking this picture. So watch out if you go there. This is a desire path on South Adams, just north or just south of West 2nd Street. This is the only pedestrian, uh, I guess, non-facility uh, to connect the businesses north of West 2nd Street and the development on Woodhill Drive. There is both a bus stop on the right and left-hand side of the road. This is looking the other way uh, from that uh, very same point. Uh, this is a, where literally the sidewalk ends um, near South Adams Street and that development that I mentioned on Woodhill Drive. And then this is Liberty Drive just south of West Third Street. So West Third Street is behind me. Um, you can see that this grass has been planted rather recently, and so the uh, desire path is not as obvious, but you can see in the background there are two pedestrians. They are shown walking between the intersection of West 3rd Street and the businesses at Whitehall Plaza. So for the past 20 years, um, the city of Bloomington has uh, allocations for new sidewalk constructions have come from the council sidewalk committee um, and the process that the projects get to be um, discussed. Um, most of those projects existed as rows on an Excel spreadsheet and um, the Excel spreadsheet um, had formulas and it had data that had to be manually entered and the formulas were often not inspected and unknown to the public. My first year doing this, which was last year, my job was to manually input or look up walk scores for every um, point on that spreadsheet and then manually enter them into the Excel spreadsheet. Um, and this is time that um, was, could also have been, could have been better served with um, trying to find a more um, comprehensive way or systematic way to get these data. And the same goes for the time spent contacting residents who had contacted me about missing sidewalk connections, trying to manage emails and voicemails that have left. And sometimes it's people who stop me in the street and so it's difficult to be able to follow up with them or to have that ability to do that. So um, a systematic approach for um, at all parts kind of led to some um, inefficiencies from a staff perspective. We do know that a request-based system uh, does have an inherent bias towards projects who support more affluent uh, people with more social capital, 
more education, more time and trust in the government. And um, in an ideal system that the city maintained streets could exist as part of an inventory where we could look at, number one, it could change with the dynamic uh, features of the city, uh, such as the bus route optimization when that goes um, into effect or, or if that changes, we can update the maps to, um, to new information, as well as um, it allows us to project um, a objective data onto areas in order to illuminate spaces of the greatest potential. None of the projects that I showed you earlier this evening existed on that spreadsheet that I talked about. So uh, the uh, so that's exactly what we did. So this this map that I have right here that you can I will be posting this presentation with um, written content. Um, so that link will be made available to you and you can navigate through these maps and you can zoom in. Um, so this is a map that Mark Stosberg created, uh, which really uh, spurred this spawn, spurred, spawn, this program or the, this project of mine. And so um, this is kind of where it all started. So um, we started the project with, um, or I'm sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The spatial equity analysis, uh, we, did, we did a spatial equity analysis, which is a tool through uh, the equity justice project. And uh, we put in 20 years of sidewalk funding, uh, sidewalk projects that have come through that spreadsheet and we found that um, disproportionately um, their sidewalk projects were clustered in areas that were underrepresented by unemployed residents. And there was an overrepresentation of uh, senior residents. We then, um, to test our variable about the uh, request based system, um, we put, we just chose. 100 locations from the demand data that I will soon show you in order to test how that aired in the spatial equity tool. And you will see that um, system, you see that this is now much more in favor of um, low income, extremely low income renters and cost burden households. So we're essentially, if it does nothing else, removing the uh, request based system is a step in the right direction of equity, even before you add any sort of metrics about demographic information. All right, so now we started with the idea that we need to have really great data in order to um, forecast projects that would be the best investments. And so this is this slideshow is to show and explore the data elements that we have put together for you today. It's not comprehensive, but um, uh, there, so to orient you, to these maps, you are able to um, zoom in. You can find a location, say if you're um, interested in what's going on in Broadview, you can um, simply look up uh, the hexagons around the areas that you're looking at. So this is interactive. Um, so I just wanna orient you to that. Um, this is a map that was created to determine walk potential in the city of Bloomington. And these are based on um, overlapping 10 minute tra travel maps between residential areas and destinations that people typically would like to go. So banks, restaurants, cafes, bookstores, schools. 
And the lighter areas represent areas where there's more overlap. So we see more potential for walking. And then the darker areas or the transparent areas are where there are less. Um, this tool replaces the manually applied walk score. Um, and also it has the benefit of allowing us to know how are these walk scores calculated, what is taken into account and to adjust as needed. This is a really great tool. This was uh, Mark Stosberg created this one. And we're really excited about that. So then um, for the next maps, you will notice that the entirety of the map is not shown. And the reason for that is we are looking at areas where there is currently a missing or poor condition sidewalk. Um, the hex grid, let me just zoom in here. Okay, so we have the hex grid, but they're not located over places where there aren't missing sidewalks, if that, that helps to um, demonstrate. So this is a map of missing sidewalks and population density. It's derived from the 2019 American Community Survey. We have darker areas showing areas where there is, um, it says higher population in the notes and I have to fix that because I just changed it um, so that the uh, colors pop. Um, so the white, is where there is um, there is more population density, and that's based on census block group data. Then we have missing sidewalks and walk to work data. So these are our folks who are commuting to work by walking using our sidewalk network. Again, the white areas are areas where we are seeing more of that behavior based on the ACS data that I mentioned earlier. We have, we've done the same with percentage of residents who are taking transit to work. Again, the off-white are areas where we have higher concentrations of residents who are taking transit to work. And then vehicle count score. So this asks people about how many vehicles they have in their household, the lower the number, um, the less likely households are to have um, vehicles. And um, the darker blue indicate areas where we have um, less vehicle count. So, so there's less vehicles in these areas. Again, you can explore, um, explore this map um, by census tract and take a look at areas that might be of interest to you. So this begins, so that was the data side of our, or the demand data that we have. We also included safety and harm reduction data. And these data come from the city center line data that we have that records information about our street network. And these scores are based on the speed limits of city maintained streets. So the areas that are brighter, that are popping out more, those are uh, city streets that have the highest speed limits that, um, and would, uh, we would support more pedestrian facilities towards that end, just to show priority. And then we have street width. Uh, it's the same really for um, street speed, the wider the roads, the more challenging, the more space that a pedestrian has to walk across the street, the wider the roads, the more likely it is that you will see spe speeding because it gives the um, person who's driving a car the visual cue that it is okay to go faster. And you will see that we have brighter spots along many of those higher speed streets that were in the last slide, um, but we do have some um, around College Mall as well. And then this is the demographic data that we're using to demonstrate areas where we can invest to support historically excluded groups. So this is the percentage or this map indicates the percentage of households within that census block group who are renters. 
and uh, the red areas indicate higher scores, whereas the white indicate lower scores. Um, similarly, uh, we have taken resident data, uh, the percentage of people who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, by census block group, and you can see the areas where they're, they are red or orange um, are higher, um, have a higher percentage of residents who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And then this is our missing sidewalk with median income and the red areas are areas where there is a lower reported median income and the orange is lower median income and then the white is where there is a higher median income. So that is the range of data that we have to create what are expressions or formulas that show how do these data when we put these data elements together, weighting the factors that we would like to support uh, per our comprehensive plan goals, that um, the areas that are going to be represented in the 95th percentile in terms of score or at the you know, top 10%, then um, those, those areas will become brighter or, or be indicated. So we have two different expressions to share with you. Um, we have, uh, there's expression A, which we call the demand and density expression, and that utilizes 70% of demand data, 20% safety and harm reduction, and 10% historically excluded groups. Then on the right side, we have an expression that ranks safety and harm reduction data at 50%, demand and density at 40%, and then historically excluded groups at 10%. And here's how we have used the data. Um, I'm, I created a GIF that uh, shows to what extent we weighted each data element in the creation of these two expressions. So expression A um, counts everything um, but you see that walk potential and density are the, the highest or weighted the highest. Expression B, walk potential density, as well as speed score, street width are highly weighted, but we don't have any of the ACS data about commuting behaviors as part of that um, expression. And here are the results. So this is the option one. This is the demand and density-based approach. And we have, as you will see, we have brighter areas. So the brighter areas are, are the ones that are scoring the highest. Uh, we have areas that are close to the downtown core. You'll notice that. And then we have um, some spots that are on the east side and then the north central side that have risen to the top of that expression. Then option two, this is the safety and harm reduction expression. And you will see that some of the areas that were in the previous expression um, are evident here as well. They are in the brighter areas. So especially in the downtown school or the downtown area, definitely influenced by that walk potential. And, um, but we do have brighter areas um, on uh, North Walnut, and South Walnut, as well as some areas on Bloomfield and uh, West Third and East Third. And here I've created another one of these great slidey maps where you can look at how the two different expressions, um, how they compare and contrast. And you can zoom in on these, right? But yeah. So you can zoom in and look if there's a particular place that is of interest to you, you can, you can see it through the two different lenses of the expressions. Okay. So um, 
project, the mechanisms that we are using, we want to present some other considerations for these data um, as we think about uh, the potential to expand our sidewalk network. Um, we recognize that uh, the priority or the ability to forecast areas that are going to be the best investment for the community are only as good as the data from which it was informed. So one of the things that we, um, we would like to see or be able to delve in more to is more um, updated sidewalk condition data. As I mentioned before, the missing sidewalk map was created from the 2018 LIDAR scan data. And um, there were some limitations with that data, especially as it related to finding areas where there was ADA noncompliance in terms of sidewalk condition and areas where the road was really wide and in areas where there was parking that was happening alongside the road. And so the scan wasn't able to take that into account. So um, we request a greater availability of LIDAR data and field survey data to the degree of accuracy that would allow for a more thorough analysis of the sidewalk deterioration and ADA noncompliance issues. And then secondly, um, to understand the barriers as they exist within the sidewalk network, we need to be able to identify the circumstances that lead to particularly poor access um, or situations where a combination of individual and contextual factors can impede access for persons with disabilities. For this, um, this is the human element. This requires partnerships, particularly with the Council on Community Accessibility um, and being able to do more qualitative data collection, which could look like focus groups, interviews, mapping exercises, and, and interviews with key informed individuals. We believe that an investment towards this end will deliver a greater understanding of the conditions for accessibility in our sidewalk network and will, um, will be uh, support a better product, especially for persons whose needs are least met by a disconnected sidewalk network. And that is all I have for you today um, and my presentation. Thank you for your time. And um, I'm excited to hear your questions. Thank you. I was in the process of asking you to clear the screen, but you beat me to it. So thank you very much for the report. I will now go to council members for questions. And I see council member Rollo. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I wondered uh, about um, whether you study uh, sidewalk network density. That is, um, how many sidewalks are there available to a household within a certain radius? Um, I believe we do have a score for kilometers of missing sidewalks per census block group. That's how we, um, we were trying to visualize that data. Um, we didn't include it in the expression because that data came later, um, but we do have that data available. Um, the, the point I'm, I'm asking about is that there are areas that have um, sidewalks, missing sidewalks, but a block away, they may have another sidewalk or even across the street, they may have a sidewalk. Um, in some areas, you will go several streets within a subdivision, for instance, and not find a single sidewalk. Do you have an evaluation of that scenario that we can rank? Because that, mm -hmm. that speaks to availability. It's pretty mm -hmm. basic, so. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. From my standpoint, um, and I don't, I, maybe I didn't mention this earlier. Um, so it isn't preferred that every single street 
has a sidewalk facility. We recognize that there are contexts where perhaps, if, say it's a low volume or a low speed street, that, um, that it might be okay to do like a neighborhood residential street, um, a street that would be eligible for a traffic calming program would be able to seek that outlet um, because it gets much of the same benefits, but without the um, extraordinary costs of new sidewalk development. So uh, that would require a little more focus on what areas, like if, if we're working with limited resources, which inevitably we are, and we look at the maps, we're going to want to identify areas that the sidewalk is the preferred treatment. And then, um, and then we can use um, the, the missing sidewalks. Okay, so I, I guess that's what I'm getting to is exactly what you touched on, which is limited resources. And so if we can only employ $350,000 a year that doesn't get as much sidewalk. So what we need to do is cut out redundancy. So the uh, sidewalk network density seems to me an, avail an important tool to, um, to be able to uh, evaluate that redundancy. Do you, do, you see, do you follow what I'm saying? That if you've got a sidewalk across the street or if you have it a block away, um, then, you, then it's a different priority than a neighborhood that doesn't have a sidewalk for three blocks. And, uh, and you know, so um, I have other questions, uh, President Sims. Uh, should I continue or do you want to come back? No, we'll, we'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Do we have any other questions from council members? Uh, council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation, Ms. Rickbile. Um, it'll take me a while to digest all that. Um, but uh, I, my question is, um, is this, uh, have you developed this as a tool to help the council, the council Transportation Committee allocate the sidewalk funds? Is that the purpose? That was the inspiration for this project, but really you could do this for any um, public public good or, or public resource that has a limitation of funds for the purposes of priority. For pedestrian transportation or sidewalks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have any other questions from council, council member Smith. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Rick Beal. That was a great report, and uh, I appreciate all the work you've done on it, and I know it was a lot of work. So thank you very much, and Mr. Stosberg, too. Um, I had a question from a constituent just yesterday or the day before that, um, talking about sidewalks. They said um, it, it, in the process, because I was kind of describing your, your, your activities, um, what does it then give us a master list of will it provide to us on the sidewalk group um, a master list of sidewalks across the city that um, will kind of give us an idea of how many we're missing and how many are needed and, and of course with the various uh, factors involved with whether they're maybe needed to be prioritized or not, but will it give us kind of a master list? It could, absolutely. So the, um, the, the beauty of this is that it's, it's the data. And so however um, it is best determined to prioritize that, that data through different expressions, um, that has still yet to be written. But once it is, and once that is decided, that will provide a list of locations that could then um, be um, included as part of a list of priority. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. I think I think it was a, a great thing that uh, brought a lot of objective data into the system 
and into this process. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Council Member Rosenbarger. Thank you. I just uh, wanted to kind of continue the conversation, I guess, about connectivity. Thank you very much for that presentation. I also uh, want to dive deeper with the story map on my own because it's a lot to process. Um, I guess the idea of connectivity to me uh, and prior where to prioritize, I mean, I, I think to me, if there's a sidewalk on one side of the road, that doesn't necessarily mean there should not be one on the other side of the road because if you've got folks having to do multiple crossings or, you know, it's a place where a lot of people are walking on the other side and there's like potentially that desired path that you were talking about. Um, I don't know, I guess I just wanted to get your uh, input on that, like not necessarily like what makes the most sense because I think your whole presentation was about like what makes the most sense for where sidewalks should be. Um, but just, I guess that idea of like, are we looking at places that don't have any or are we looking at like connectivity and where people are walking? Um, so yeah, I agree that it's it's very context specific. So a road again, like West Bloomfield Road that carries 20,000 cars per day, there's only one pedestrian facility on one side. And so I would argue that um, with a road that size, that it would be good to have a pedestrian, two pedestrian facility or a pedestrian facility on either side. That's that's the ideal. That's what we're, we're looking for. Um, we know that um, when it comes to accessibility, having a sidewalk on one side of the street um, may pose um, some limitations, especially for people who maybe require the concrete of a sidewalk to be established. and and not having it could mean that that person is stranded. Um, so we definitely um, support safety, but walk potential, again, is also a very valuable um, tool for us. It's a, it's a very valuable data point because a safe sidewalk is only safe insofar as it's used. Um, and so prior, uh, the preference or the preferred um, expression, um, as as I have been talking about this with the with the project collaborators, has been for more of an emphasis on demand. For that reason, is that, is that complete for you, Councilmember Rosenbarger? Yes, thank you. Okay. I didn't know if I should say thank you or not. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, it's always proper to say thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, do we have any other council members? Okay, we okay, seeing none, we'll go now to, again to Council Member Rollo. Thanks, President Sims. Um, yeah, I, I had a question about uh, the evaluation of harm reduction. Uh, you, you, you said, uh, you know, that had to do with street volume and, um, you know, so forth, but do we do, do we evaluate also on the basis of uh, traffic counts and speed and speed? And in other words, um, there are residential streets that have, you know, a 25 mile an hour speed limit uh, that carry cut through traffic, for instance. I mean, this goes back to actually a question, a, a topic that you raised a moment ago, a few minutes ago, which was um, to remove request-based, um, uh, uh, you know, motivations for for sidewalk funds. And um, I, I, I have mixed views on that because I think that neighborhoods bring forward uh, requests on the basis of things like harm reduction. So they have, um, you know, kids walking to school, for instance, that use a, a route within a neighborhood that has no sidewalks. And you might not think that that would be, uh, you know, an important place for a sidewalk, but we get a request about it. Um, and a lot of them have occurred that way. In fact, a lot of requests that we've received on the council sidewalk committee have been, as it turns out, areas where desire paths were already evident, things like that. 
anyway, my question is, um, so when you're evaluating this, you're doing it on, on uh, counts, vehicle counts and vehicle speed actually measured, not just um, speed limits on a residential street. Is that correct? For the uh, safety harm reduction data, it was posted speed limit. And uh, for the purposes of, of this, this presentation and street width, given limited time, I would have loved to have had measured speed data, um, but the I was only able to get 200 different measurements. And so it wasn't as comprehensive as I would have liked, um, but, uh, it's, it's you, I did look at how much uh, differentiation between the posted speed limit and the measured speed limits. And I found that um, it's pretty consistent. There, there's definitely speed non-compliance, um, but most people are speeding the same over the speed limit of the posted speed limit. So it, it is a little bit of an indicator and I would love more information. And we do have information about AADT um, and we could add more data elements to support or, or even crash data to support uh, a expression that supports safety and harm reduction. I would love to see that happen. Um, but but um, again, um, if it's cut through traffic in a residential neighborhood, um, that the, the best way or the evidence of the best way to curb those behaviors is through traffic calming installations, which are, are far less expensive, especially for residential areas where we know that there's quite a lot of demand for that. What do you think of the utility of, of uh, request-based um, you know, way of evaluating need, uh, yeah. you know, like a neighborhood, unbeknownst to you or I, you know, they actually live it and they say, you know, all the kids take that street and, um, uh, you know, people speed to work, you know, before or after work. And so it's not even consistent during the day, but exactly when the kids are going to school or so forth. So they have that experiential kind of knowledge. So uh, I don't see that how that jibes with removing the request-based um, means of uh, determining sidewalk need. Sure. I'm sorry if I misspoke. I'm not, we are removing a solely request-based prioritization system. So request, it, what is really important about request space is that it is kept in context with the other information that we're using it. So the past process that we had, that was the gateway through which you had to enter to even be considered. And that qualitative information, that understanding of the conditions as they exist and, and how that reflects the lived experience that are in that area, that is extremely valuable information to have. Um, that's why that was one of the considerations we had for getting more data to collect that qualitative data, especially for people who have accessibility needs. Um, and so, uh, but in terms of being the, uh, the gateway or being the first filter, um, it, it just seems that by virtue of, of the accountability structure and, and how if I get an email about a sidewalk, a missing sidewalk, and someone has the time or the trust to reach out to me and, and make sure that it gets on the spreadsheet that goes to the, the transportation committee, that is going to like that that will have a bias towards someone who has the time, someone who knows how to get a hold of me, someone who perhaps can get a hold of you who gets a hold of me and that accountability structure. Because if someone stops me while I'm at Blooming Foods and they request something, that's going to be harder for me to recall in the fall when I am having a 
um, or I'm looking at the inventory of sidewalk projects, that, that information isn't going to be um, systematically gathered. And so there is the potential for bias. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, I'm glad to hear that for that, uh, um, you know, you clarified it, uh, that it's not going to be removed, because I think it's an important part of it. Um, but, but I see that it, it can be problematic as well. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Rallo. Do we have any other questions from councilors? Okay, seeing, I'm sorry, Council Member Bolin. No question, just a thank you to Ms. Rickbile for an excellent presentation. Can we get the slides and can we get especially the image that lets us go back and forth to show? Yes. Uh, so yeah, if you can send that as, I mean, is it, a, is it in slide format or is it like just a, a document? Yeah, it's, a, it's an ArcGIS story map that you can access um, through the online portal. So there's a link um, and I have provided the link to the meeting oh, house wonderful. and they have posted that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Wait, where's the link? I can, I can put it in the chat right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Either that or send it to us. Thank you very much. Um, and there will be no presentation or no uh, PowerPoint or anything that you could send to us. We have to access it online. Is that what I just heard? I, I can turn it into a PDF as well. If that, that would be helpful. That would be helpful for me. Um, and probably if you could send it to everyone that, that needs it. Um, okay, and um, I do have some questions, but in the interest of time, um, what I'd like to do is um, uh, sometime in the future, just get in touch with you so we can just kind of sit down and you can explain some things. I mean, there's a lot of information. Um, and particularly, I'd like to talk more just with the concept of equity across the city. Um, and, and like you pretty much experience uh, with nine different council members, we have nine different, in many cases, priorities, um, nine different uh, views of equity, depending on which lens you're looking through. So I'd kind of like to get a little closer and see exactly how you're looking through it or, or our program is looking through that. Um, um, and one last request for any other questions from council members. And seeing none, thank you very much for the presentation, Mr. Rickfield. And um, we'll be in touch, I'm sure. All right, excellent. Thank you, I look forward to it. Thank you, have a good evening. Okay, um, back to the agenda. We'll now move down to council committees. Do we have any reports from council committees? Okay, seeing none, moving further in the agenda. We'll now go to public comment. Um, please understand that it's a maximum of 20 minutes to set aside for this section for public comment. Um, you will be allowed three minutes uh, for your comments. Um, I would ask that you use the raised hand function on Zoom uh, to indicate your desire to publicly speak. Um, and you can get there through the participants button, the reactions button, or the more buttons at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you're on a mobile device or a phone, um, you can reach us at star nine. Um, if neither of those work, you can send a note to the meeting host via the chat functions on Zoom. Um, and as always, we ask you to please identify yourself um, when speaking. Um, Mr. Lucas, I see one hand. Do you see the same? I do, yes. Uh, Craig Alexander is up first. Hi, Hi, Mr. Alexander, how are you? Hi, thanks, I'm great. Um, my name is Greg Alexander. Uh, I, I didn't realize I, I would be following such a great presentation. Um, I, I wanna um, echo uh, something that Mallory just said um, about the privilege of the sort of people who, who actually come to you guys. And I, I embody that. Um, and so, you know, I'm gonna talk to you in a little bit about a sidewalk in the trades district, but I'm so glad that she showed you sidewalks on South Adams Street and West Bloomfield Road, because when you go out there, it becomes very apparent if you're a pedestrian looking at the other pedestrians, that there are a number of, of impoverished neighborhoods out there where that street is, is an unavoidable fact for their life and they're walking in the mud beside it. Um, and just very briefly, um, I would say, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it, we shouldn't build a single sidewalk in um, 
council member Rollo's district until after we build sidewalks on both sides of Bloomfield Road and Adams Street. Like that's, I'm sorry to put it that way, but we, we've been doing this too long uh, to be even pretending. So um, and I just wanna draw also attention on those maps. Each time there's like a tiny missing sidewalk dot, you could almost miss it on the map. I hope you guys play with those maps, but that tiny missing sidewalk gap that destroys it. There's there's no sidewalk. If there's a tiny piece that's missing, then there's no sidewalk. You can't get from here to there without crossing that tiny gap. Um, anyway, so I want to talk to you. Um, I read you reports. Uh, that's just something I do. Um, and uh, in order to understand this report, I guess you need a little bit of background um, on Rogers Street by the Trades District. Uh, there's a sidewalk on the west side and the east side, and they were closing the sidewalks on one side, the other side, both sides um, for different projects for the trades district and also for building a uh, beeline heights, which is a public private partnership of affordable kind of uh, low rent apartments, um, 34 units right on the beeline and, and Rogers at about 10th street. And um, for one of those, they wanted to close the sidewalk on the west side of the street. So they needed to make the sidewalk on the east side handicap accessible. And so what they did is they just, they just mounded um, asphalt where the sidewalk, where there were driveway cuts that were unaccessible. They just simply mounted asphalt. And it's, you know, I, I laughed when I saw that for, for two reasons. Um, one is that you're never gonna see a wheelchair mount that. Maybe, maybe a, a Special Olympics hero could do that, but you're never gonna see a, a wheelchair actually take that, that asphalt mound. Um, and the other is uh, that the sidewalk on the east side was closed too. So they closed the sidewalk on the west side and then they made the sidewalk on the east side accessible, but the east sidewalk was closed too. So, you know, it's just like, it's a real example of how the engineering department simply was phoning in their responsibilities uh, for accessibility. But so those apartments are built now. And so one of the residents there um, made this U report and they, uh, so they, they're disabled. And if you look at it, disability and poverty. I'm sorry, Mr. Alexander, your time is uh Okay. Am I, am I correct, Mr. Lucas? On the timer, yes. So sorry, Mr. Alexander, you have three minutes. So thank you for your comments. Sorry, I prepared as a five minute, have a great Yeah, thank you. Do, do we have any else to speak, Mr. Lucas? No, I don't believe so. Okay, thank you. We'll give it just a second. And seeing no more indicators. Okay, we'll now move on into the agenda. We're down to appointments to boards and commissions. Do we have any appointments this evening? Council Member Scambellari. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Community Affairs Committee, we would like to nominate James Sanders for the Martin Luther King Jr. Birthday Celebration Commission, seat C2. Second. Thank you, Ben Copley. Um, moved and seconded. Um, from the Community Affairs Committee, that Mr. James Sanders for C C2 be um, appointed to the Martin Luther King Jr. Birthday Commission. Is that correct, Councilmember Scambelli? I do believe so. Thank you. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Councilmember Bowling. Yes. Rosenberger. Yes. Kimberly? Yes. Kim's? Yes. Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Amber? Yes. And Rob? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And that motion passes 9 0. Um, congratulations, Mr. Sanders. Um, I know we just move on, but uh, Mr. Sanders has been the chair of that commission for several years and been a member for longer than that. Does a, a very admirable job. So um, congratulations, Mr. Sanders. Okay, do we have any other appointments? Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I move that we appoint uh, Shelby Ford to seat C11 of the Community Advisory on Public Safety Commission. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. And Ms. Shelby Ford be appointed to seat C11 on the CAPS Commission. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Thank 
All right. Councilmember Rosenberger. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, did I Kimberly? Right? Yes. Jones? Yes. Matt Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sanford? Yes. Rowan? Yes. I did not hear Councilmember Volan. I think we got a lot. Of I didn't hear my name. Uh, Volan, yes. Oh, okay. Well, that explains it. Thanks. Yeah. I have the, that, that motion passes 8 0. And I think earlier in some of the other votes, I mentioned 9 0. I just want to correct that. Um, we do have a council member absent this evening. So um, if the clerk, if you can clean up after this thinking too far ahead, President, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much and congratulations and Ms. Shelby Ford, um, appointee to the CAPS Commission. Um, I also, uh, I think Councilmember P. Ma Smith, we all know this, but that seat expires in January 31st of 2023. Um, for those that are, I do I believe we're correct, but just wanna let everyone know. Okay, do we have any other Councilmember P. Ma Smith? Yes, um, I have an unusual motion, which is to remove Matthew Diaz as an appointee to the CAPS Commission due to non-attendance. Second. Thank you, it's been properly moved and second that um, uh, Commissioner Matthew Diaz uh, be removed from the CAPS Commission uh, due to non-attendance. Uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, I'd just like to clarify that um, Mr. Diaz has not attended a single meeting and has been contacted repeatedly and uh, has not replied. So um, there is obviously something else happening in his life. And uh, so we'd like to open up that seat for somebody else. Thank you. Okay, it's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollin? Yes. Volan? Yes. And Rosenbarger? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, and that motion passes 8-0. Thank you. Do we have any further appointments to boards or commissions from councilors? Okay, thank you. Seeing none, moving down the agenda, we have no um, pieces of legislation for second reading and resolutions this evening. So we'll move to legislation for first readings. Council Member Scambler. Yes, Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 21-41 be introduced and read by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved. Second, that Ordinance 21-21 be introduced and read by the group by title and synopsis only. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Sims. Yes. Eva Smith. Yes. Smith. Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambolari? Yes. Thank you. Councilmember Bolin, did you have a question or anything? Uh, yes, Mr. President, I wanted to move to discharge the Committee of the Whole from hearing this piece of legislation. Did you make some sort of a motion or something? Or is that a statement? I, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm moving to discharge this piece of legislation from being heard by the Committee of the Whole. Okay, then properly move. Second. There's already a motion on the table, Mr. President. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm being premature. That, You're right. I'm sorry, Mr. President. Sure. Thank you. I was just a little bit confused there just for a second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2141, an ordinance authorizing the refunding of certain outstanding sewage works revenue bonds of the city, authorizing the issuance of the City of Bloomington, Indiana sewage works refunding revenue bonds of 2021 to provide funds for such refunding and the payment of the cost thereof and addressing other matters connected therewith. The synopsis says as follows. This ordinance authorizes the City of Bloomington to issue its sewage works refunding revenue bonds of 2021 in one or more series in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed $8,500,000. The 2021 bonds will be issued to refund the, the city's currently outstanding sewage works refunding revenue bonds series 2012A and its currently outstanding sewage works revenue bonds series 2012C for all for the purpose of obtaining lower interest rate interest costs and a reduction of debt service payments on such outstanding bonds, thereby achieving significant savings for the city. Okay, thank you, Clerk Bowden. Um, and I will get to you, Mr. Bowden. Um, but I will refer this um, ordinance 21-41 to the Committee of the Whole um, slated for the next November 10th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Council Member Bowden. Yes, sir. I'd like to discharge the matter from the Committee of the Whole. I'd like to move to discharge it. Second. Okay, thank you. It's a motion on the floor to discharge this uh, ordinance from the Committee of the Whole. It's been seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? I'm sorry, Council Member Scambler. Yes, thank you. Um, just to confirm understanding of what that means for the public, um, Council the Committee of the Whole would not need to see it, correct? And then we would simply move to a vote on November, whatever you said, 17th. Is that correct? Well, it would move to the 17th. I would refer to it on November 10th. So if, if his motion passes, yes, to the 17th. But for second reading, then not for here. Correct. Correct. Okay, um, Mr. Lucas, is this a, a Council Member Rollo? Uh, well, I was curious to know uh, how the, you feel, President Sims, about uh, the, the direction directing this uh, legislation. Um, thank you. Um, I had this discussion individually with two other council members throughout today. And um, after discussing it with our legal counsel and our uh, council administrator, um, one, and I don't wanna be premature, but one of the ordinances will include an appropriation ordinance. Um, this motion won't affect that. I don't think other than there won't be a committee he hearing or a committee meeting to hear that. Um, me personally, I think um, a majority of council members, and I may be incorrect, uh, we'll see the vote, but I think the majority of council members appreciate and, and look, for, or look for the information sharing from the full body of council members in the committee meeting, committee of the whole meeting. Um, so that's um, why I refer to it, I think. And, and I'm okay with the other motions. So that's, I hope that answered your question. Uh, thank you for addressing I, it. I, well, and I will further say that um, we can do that um, if it passes. But one of my concerns um, as uh, leadership on this council is that if we get sidetracked on the 17th and um, for some reason we can't complete that, then that meeting will have to be postponed and that will affect the, uh, the meeting notice for the app board in that ordinance and would potentially create some other scheduling issues. Um, it'll work, um, but this is just much cleaner. And I think um, the desired method of, of uh, what I think is a majority of counselors. Thank you. You're welcome. Council member Bowling. 
Yes, thank you. As the maker of the motion, I wasn't sure I had the opportunity to speak on it. So I just wanted to say briefly that while I certainly understand and appreciate the interest of any member to uh, uh, to have a couple of opportunities to consider something, uh, I think that this piece of legislation and frankly, all of them that are on the agenda tonight are pretty perfunctory. Uh, they don't require uh, two meetings and that we are unlikely to, um, I mean, uh, this is just, these are just uh, pretty straightforward, uncontroversial pieces of legislation. So that's why I'm recommending it. I'll be doing it for the other three pieces of legislation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any more discussion on this motion um, to remove the committee of the whole recommendation away from the president? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on that motion? Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Yes. No. Amber? No. Rallo? No. Bowen? Yes. Yes. Amber Yes. Pimps? No. Thank you. The vote is four to four, and the motion fails by no majority. And this piece of legislation, Ordinance 21 41, uh, as I stated earlier, will be referred to the November 10th committee meeting beginning at 6 30 p.m. I do believe we have more legislation for first reading. Councilmember Scambellari. Yes, Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 21 42 be introduced and read by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you, it's been properly moved and second that ordinance 21-42 be read by title and synopsis only by the clerk. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Smith? Yes. Sandra? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Bowen? Yes. President Parker? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Sims? Yes. And Piedmont Smith? Yes. Thank you. The motion to introduce Ordinance 21 42 passes. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2142, an ordinance authorizing the refinancing of a certain equipment lease purchase agreement of the city authorizing the issuance of the City of Bloomington, Indiana General Revenue Annual Appropriation Refunding Bonds of 2021 to provide funds for such refinancing and the payment of the cost thereof, appropriating the proceeds derived from the sale of such refunding bonds and addressing other matters connected therewith. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance authorizes the City of Bloomington to issue its General Revenue Annual Appropriation Refunding Bonds of 2021 in one or more series in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed $13,100,000 and, and appropriates the proceeds thereof. The 2021 bonds will be issued to refinance the city's obligations under the equipment lease purchase agreement dated November 30th, 2017 between the Bank of America Public Capital Corporation as lessor and the city as lessee related to the purchase, installation, and financing of certain solar panel systems and related work, all for the purpose of obtaining lower interest costs and a reduction of debt service payments on such outstanding lease payments, thereby achieving significant savings for the city. Thank you, Clerk Bowden. Um, I am referring, it's referring Ordinance 21-42 to the Committee of the Whole to meet on November 10th, beginning at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Council Member Bowden. Uh, seeing that the vote uh, did not uh, carry in the first one, I'm not going to bother to make a motion the next three, but I will not be attending the meeting of the committee the whole next week. I wish my colleagues luck in uh, uh, seeing to these I, these matters. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bowen. I appreciate your statement. Um, as I mentioned with at least one of our other colleagues earlier today, um, I think there are um, 
regardless of how we feel about legislation, I think our charter or uh, we should plan to attend every meeting. And we understand that people don't sometimes. Um, but like I did share with my other colleague that I was discussing with, you always have the option of not to come to a council meeting. Um, just please properly, as we understand, inform the clerk, the council president, and the council leadership. Mr. Boland, did you have anything else, sir? I simply reiterate my objection in principle to the Committee of the Whole. As a committee, it's not an obligatory meeting, which is why I don't plan to attend it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That is your prerogative. Thank you very much. I do believe we have more legislation for first reading. Council Member Scandler. Yes, Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 21-43 be introduced in red by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second that Ordinance 21-43 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Rosenbacher? Yes. Kimberly? Yes. Sims? Yes. Yvonne yes. Smith? Yes. And Smith? Yes. Thank you, and that motion passes. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2143 to amend Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Vehicles and Traffic regarding amending Section 1532.090 to adjust the time of a limited parking zone on 2nd Street, Sections 1512.010, 1512.030, 1516.010, 1516.010, 1516.010. Fifteen thirty two zero eight zero, fifteen thirty two one zero zero, and fifteen thirty seven zero two zero to reflect the changing of the name of Jordan Avenue to Eagleson Avenue. Sections fifteen thirty two zero three zero and fifteen thirty two zero eight zero to add angle parking and no parking zones to Illinois Court. Section fifteen thirty two one zero zero and Schedule O loading zones to add one loading zone to East Seventh Street. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends Title 15, Vehicles and Traffic of the Bloomington Municipal Code and comes forth at the request of city staff and parking and traffic commissions. The ordinance makes the following changes. It changes the time limit of a limited parking zone on 2nd Street. It amends the code to reflect the changing name of Jordan Avenue to Eagleson Avenue. It adds angle parking and no parking zones to West William Court, Illinois Court, and it adds a loading zone to East 7th Street. Thank you, Clerk Bowden. Um, I am referring, referring Ordinance 21-43 to the Committee of the Whole to meet on November 10th, beginning at 6.30 p.m. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, I, um, I move to uh, a counter proposal to President Sims and to refer this item to the Transportation Committee. Second. Thank you. Um, it's been properly moved and second um, that this referral, President's referral, be removed and sent to the Transportation Committee, if I heard correctly. I do believe so. Um, Mr. Lucas, is this a simple majority vote? Thank yes, you. Yes, and also okay. the motion is amendable and debatable. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, it's been properly moved and second to remove ordinance 2143 and refer it to the transportation committee. Um, I think one thing, council member P. Smith is part of that motion and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Lucas, should include where it's, when it's, ref not only where, but when, if I'm not mistaken, we need a date and time as well. I, yes. I'm sorry, I should have included yeah. that. Um, oh, that's okay. I'm just reminding so we get everything correct. Thank you. Yeah, so I'd like to amend my motion and add to it um, that I, so I would like to refer ordinance um, 2143 to the Transportation Committee to meet at 7.30 p.m. Well, 8 p.m. 
on November 10th. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second that um, ordinance 21 43 be uh, moved move to the Transportation Committee at 8 p.m. on November 10th. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Um, Councilmember Bowman? Yes. Councilmember Bowman? Yes. Councilmember Bowman? Yes. Councilmember Bowman? Yes. Councilmember I'm oh. looking at a see I am raised. It's I see oh, Count, Council Member Rosenbarger. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I just thought this was debatable. Uh, uh, so it is. It is. I just, I just want, didn't okay. see your hand. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. I just like put it in front of me. It's probably the blend of my face. Um, uh, uh, going through the packet for me, um, the four ordinances that we're discussing tonight at first reading are very straightforward, and I have no questions and I'm ready to vote on them. I mean, happy to see a presentation, but I really appreciate the thoroughness of all of the submitted ordinances, especially from the planning department. I think the engineers that the memos were very detailed and um, I just have no question. So I personally don't um, feel a need to attend a committee of the whole or transportation committee meeting on these ordinances because I, I am all set with no questions on these. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenbarger. Councilmember Bowling. Yes, I seconded this on principle, but I agree with Councilmember Rosenbarger that I don't, I'm familiar with this piece of legislation. Most Title 15 legislation is very straightforward. There's, uh, if there was any um, controversial or uh, uh, matter within it or something that needed extra scrutiny, I would uh, you know, be pleased to see it go to uh, any committee, but uh, so I'll be abstaining on this vote because I don't want to vote against uh, something that I, uh, I seconded. Thank you. That's Mayor P. Miles Smith. Yes, um, I, uh, my reasoning for um, sending this to the transportation committee is that um, unlike the, uh, the refinancing ordinances that we had um, earlier this evening, I think uh, this one um, should have a committee hearing because it does uh, uh, impact parking and the streets where people live. So it's much closer to, to home for people. Um, and so uh, I wanna give people an ample opportunity to weigh in and that's what a committee meeting does. However, I do not feel like um, all nine council members need to uh, review this twice. Um, and it, it is logically in the realm of the transportation committee. So that's why I made the motion. Thank you for your comments. Any more debate? Okay, thank you. It's been properly moved a second with a council, I'm sorry, will the clerk please call the roll? Um, on this motion to move ordinance 21-43 um, to, I'm sorry, to remove this ordinance um, to be heard at the Transportation Committee at 8 p.m. on November 10th. Yes, Councilmember Rallo? Uh, no. Bowling? Abstain. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambori? No. Sims? No. Piemont Smith? Yes. Smith? No. Sandberg? No. Thank you. Um, that motion fails three, five, one. Um, and the original reference, or I'm sorry, referral by the president uh, for next Wednesday, November 10th at 6, beginning at 6.30 p.m. Um, will stand. I do believe we have another piece of first of legislation for first reading this evening. Council Member Scambleri. Yes, thank you. Mr. President, I move that ordinance 21-44 be introduced and read by title and synopsis only. Second. 
Thank you. It's been properly moved and seconded that ordinance 21-44 be um, introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Uh, just did, quick, did I say that? Did I say something wrong? I saw the look uh, on Just a face. quick clarification. Um, the last vote, I thought I heard you say that it was 351 and I had 251. No, 251 is what I got. I, I may have said that. Thank you. 251. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now, will the clerk please call the roll? Absolutely. Start with Councilmember Volan. Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Scandalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. And Rollo? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That motion passes. It's been moved and second. That ordinance 21 44 uh, be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 21 44 to amend Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Vehicles and Traffic regarding amending Chapter 1532 to, to add a new schedule for reserved motorcycle parking. Section 1537210 to clarify that the parking services director or designate may sell up to 80 employee parking permits total in zones four and five. Section 1548019 to provide that vehicles with accessible decals, placards, or plates may park in accessible parking spaces designated for electric vehicles, whether or not the vehicle is electric or is being charged and section 1548070 to delete the administrative fee for towed vehicles. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends Title 15, Vehicles and Traffic of the Bloomington Municipal Code and comes forth at the request of city staff and, and the parking commissions. The ordinance makes the following changes. It creates a new schedule designating on-street reserved motorcycle parking. It allows the parking services director to to sell a total of 80 employee parking permits annually in zones four and five total, instead of a maximum of 40 spaces in each zone. It clarifies that anyone with a disability placard, plate, or decal may park in accessible parking spaces designated for vehicle electric vehicles, regardless of whether they have an electric vehicle or are charging the vehicle. And it deletes the administrative towing fee currently paid to the Bloomington Police Department. Thank you very much, Clerk Bowden. Um, as previously, I am referring Ordinance 21-44 to the Committee of the Whole to meet on, on November 10th, beginning at 6.30 p.m. Okay, looking around, thank you all for that. Moving on into the agenda, we'll now um, go into additional public comment. If anyone, I would um, remind folks that um, Members of the public may speak on matters of community concern, not listed on the agenda at one of the two public comment opportunities, but not both. Citizens will be allowed three minutes and please indicate your desire to publicly speak by using the raised hand function in Zoom. Um, you can get there with the participants button, the reactions button, or the more buttons at the bottom of the page. Um, a mobile device or your phone can reach us through star nine. And if neither of those work, you can send us a note to the meeting host via meeting host via chat function on Zoom. Um, Mr. Lucas, uh, do we have any takers? I do see a hand raised uh, from Greg Alexander, who spoke earlier. And uh, I'll note that our agenda provides that uh, speakers will have five minutes unless that time period is reduced by the presiding officer. Uh, if several people would like to speak, I don't know if the, the president or the council would like to uh, uh, entertain a, a two minute comment from Mr. Alexander, uh, since he was the only individual to speak at the earlier uh, portion of the meeting. Um, as far as process, Mr. Lucas, I um, can support the will of the council. Um, and I, I read earlier 
but if we want to alter that. Um, so what is the will of the council? Council Member Boland. Well, I think uh, Mr. Lucas is pointing out that uh, uh, we would normally provide five minutes unless there were more people, more than four people speaking. So I would support letting him speak for another two minutes. Thank you. Okay, any further comments? Okay, and thank you. And Mr. Lucas, I think as presiding chair, I am fine with giving Mr. Alexander another two minutes. Um, I will say, um, when we say normally five minutes, yes, that was probably three or four months ago. Um, we've been using three minutes for public comment since that time. Um, but I do recognize this fact. And Mr. Alexander, if you're there, please identify yourself and you have an additional two minutes, sir. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Greg Alexander. Uh, I just wanted to, so this, your report comes from a person that lives in Beeline Heights Apartments, public-private partnership, supposed to be affordable apartments, specifically built downtown so that it would be by uh, a bus stop. And in order to get to the bus stop, um, they're disabled and they have to walk in the street. And that's what they say in the U report that they've been walking in the bike lane. Um, and then they, they walk until they get to a point where the sidewalk happens to be lower relative to the, relative to the street. And they can kind of pull their, their, uh, their device up onto the sidewalk at that point, but they can't use the, the so-called ramps on the sidewalk because they're not actually engineered. And um, they have to do that to ride the bus. And when they built this, they said it was specifically you know, to reduce dependence on the automobile, but they built two thirds of the land is devoted to parking lot. And this person isn't using a parking lot, parking space. They want sidewalks, but we didn't require building sidewalks. We required building parking. <laughs> and so I just, uh, you know, I, I really, I feel a lot of empathy for this person. And, um, and they point out that several people, including in their family in that, in that apartment are in that exact same situation. And I, I it's going to be a lot of work to do something about this, but by golly, we got to start now. And um, just for the record, I'm in favor of three-minute comments. I just didn't know, and you got to put it in your agenda if you change. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. No disrespect um, intended. And I believe when we started, I said three minutes, but I will be clear in the future. So thank you very much for your public comment and participating. Okay. Um, do we have anyone else, Mr. Lucas? No, I don't believe so. Okay, thank you very much. We'll now move down to the agenda and matters pertaining to council schedule. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, mention the work session that's scheduled this Friday and see if we'll have enough council members to, to go ahead with that work session. Uh, the items that I believe will be ready for your preview uh, include an ordinance that uh, several council members have worked to bring forward uh, that would regulate certain pet shops here in Bloomington. Uh, that would be an amendment to, I believe, the uh, Title VII of the Municipal Code. Uh, the other legislative item that may be ready for your preview is an end of the year appropriation ordinance that the controller's office uh, has been working to put together. Uh, this is an annual uh, an ordinance typically brought at the end of each year to uh, often shift funds from, from one category to another within departments or from one department to another uh, to uh, in part help balance uh, those funds. Uh, and then finally, uh, this Friday could be an opportunity for the council to, uh, if it would like, uh, begin discussing the uh, annual schedule for next year. Uh, there was a draft circulated to council members and uh, that will soon appear in your packet uh, for formal consideration, but if there are uh, matters related to that that you would like to begin discussing, uh, this, this Friday's work session could be an opportunity to do that as well. So if perhaps members could indicate whether they would be able to attend this Friday, we can get a sense of uh, Okay, I see, thought I saw one, two, three, four, five hands. So that's six hands. So that is a majority. Um, I'm assuming Council Member Rosenbarger did not raise a hand. So that's enough for us to get to meet Friday at noon. Yes. Thank and you. And that's very. all I have uh, this evening under under scheduling. Okay. Thank you very very much. Um, and seeing that we have no further business this evening, um, 
I call this meeting to an, to adjourn. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Um, thanks everyone for showing up. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you all.